under international law. The first speaker is Mr. Temur Malik, an eminent lawyer and founder of Quoting the Law, Pakistan's multidimensional law and justice initiative. He will be speaking on practices in the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir in the light of the prevailing international law, a review of post 5th August scenario. Second up is Mr. Shayan Ahmed Khan, a, re a senior research associate at Research Society of International Law and at the Center of Excellence for International Law, National Defense University, Islamabad. Uh, Mr. Shayan will be speaking on human rights violations and legal recourse. The third speaker is Dr. Sadia Zahoor, a renowned lawyer and legal consultant and advisor. In her capacity as a legal advisor, she has provided her services to many organizations such as International Committee of the Red Cross, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, amongst many others. She will be speaking on Kashmir and international judicial institutions. Uh, before I invite uh, Brig uh, Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, Acting President Ipri, for his welcome remarks, I'd just like to remind all the participants that you may send your questions directly to me using the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, I'd like to request everyone to please identify yourself and the institution that you are associated with, and please refrain from making long comments. I would like to now um, request Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, Acting President Ipri, for his welcome remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Umar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I extend a very warm welcome to the chair and distinguished panelists who have spared time to enlighten us on a very important subject of contemporary relevance. The Kashmir issue that so far has eluded a solution despite best efforts by Pakistan presents a guardian knot that needs to be untangled in the interests of peace and security in a region that contains one third of humanity. The political dimension of the conflict and the historical facts are all well known and oft debated, yet the legal aspects rooted in UN Security Council's resolutions that form the warp and woof of Pakistan's, of Pakistan's Kashmir policy remain confined to specialist's corner. There's a need therefore to understand and discuss the lawfare options germane to the issue and use these as a vanguard of our diplomatic strategy for resolution of Kashmir conflict. There's a school of thought that considers lawfare a Sisyphean endeavor because of the undue influence of international politics on the international law. Then there are those who think that our lawfare options have remained frozen in 50s environment and that there are legal options available that supplement our traditional stance on Kashmir that need to be explored. We are here today to explore all those options and would be grateful to the experts and discussants to help us understand those options and answers to a few important questions. Questions like, is there a need for a new lawfare strategy to highlight egregious human rights and international law violations? Are we doing enough on lawfare front? What are the legal steps that need to be taken to highlight Indian violation of international law, bilateral agreements, trilateral agreements, its own constitution and the customary law? What impact would steps like according the provisional status of a province to Gilgit Baltistan have on our UN resolutions based stance on Kashmir dispute. Now, these are some of the questions which I'm sure uh, would be explored during the discussion and uh, the Q&A session. Islamabad Policy Research Institute in its humble capacity has come up with a compendium of basic facts, including all relevant UN resolutions, bilateral agreements, international mediation efforts, track to initiatives, peace dialogues and human rights violations in the shape of a single volume called Kashmir Fact Book. The book is a one stop toward the horizon of all relevant facts that any researcher or a lay reader would need while exploring any aspect of the dispute. And it is hoped that it is found helpful to all those who wish to find the relevant facts about Kashmir in a single volume. With this, I invite the first speaker, Mr. Taimur Malik, to kindly deliver his talk. Over to Mr. Tangur Malik. 
uh, thank you very much uh, bismillahirrahmanirrahim it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today although uh, we are discussing a very uh, imp important topic uh, in in perhaps diff difficult circumstances uh, at the moment uh, as the first speaker i'll uh, cover uh, some sorry of the mr background. tamur if you could kindly switch on your video as well sir we can't see you thank you so much thank you sir right. so uh, as uh, as the previous speaker mentioned that there there are those of us that believe that international law doesn't work and then there are those who believe that the age of warfare is over and international disputes are increasingly going to be resolved through lawfare inter and international legal solutions i obviously being a lawyer uh, i'm of the second opinion uh, that lawfare and international legal solutions are paramount in situations like the one we face today if there is any any international issue today in the world in relation to which international law was and remains an important aspect that i believe is the kashmir issue whether it is the discussion regarding the alleged instrument of accession that is purported to have been signed by the fleeing maharaja on 26th october 1947 the illegality of the constituent assembly of jnk in view of various unsc resolution the illegality of the abrogation of article 370 and 35a of india's constitution or the continuing illegal occupation of the territory of iiojk all these issues have an important international perspective to them if we start with the issue of the instrument of accession the governor general of india at that time while accepting the accession stated the condition that as soon as law and order was restored in kashmir and her soil cleared of the invader the question of state's accession should be settled by a reference to the people this obviously hasn't happened till date the records of the indian constituent assembly debates also clearly established that jammu and kashmir required special treatment because of the various un, UN resolutions and this is why article 370 and 35a were put in the constitution at that time the illegality of unilateral action re the status of jammu and kashmir was also reaffirmed uh, in our bilateral agreements with india in particular the shimla agreement of 1972 wherein it was agreed that pending the final settlement of any of the problems between the two countries neither side shall unilaterally alter the situation and both shall prevent the organization assistance or encouragement of any acts detrimental to the maintenance of peaceful and harmonious relations india's acts uh, since that day and especially in in recent months and year uh, are contrary to this position in the context of today's discussion related to the post 5th august scenario it is important to highlight that the now uh, abrogated article 370 was portrayed by india as an interim system and labeled as a temporary provision by exempting jammu and kashmir from the provisions of the indian constitution and restricting the indian parliament's legislative power over the state to three subjects of defense foreign affairs and communication and in the event other constitutional provisions or other union powers were to be extended to kashmir the prior concurrence of the state government was required this concurrence was strictly provisional and had to be ratified by the state's constituent assembly the debate over this provision went on for around 6 months in india's parliament the un security council uh, passed a resolution 91 of 1951 which affirmed that the convening of the constituent assembly of jnk and any action that it might attempt to take to determine the future shape an affiliation of kashmir would not constitute a disposition of the state in accordance with the principle of a free and impartial plebiscite conducted by the un the constituent assembly was established and then eventually formally dissolved by resolution in january 1957 after it had framed a separate constitution for jammu and kashmir and 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 declared uh, something that of course we don't agree with that the whole of the former princely state to be an integral part of the union of india and this was in defiance of unsc resolutions 
And in, it was in this context that the United Nations Security Council through resolution 122 of 1957 reaffirmed the action by the Constituent Assembly would not satisfy its earlier resolutions calling for, for a plebiscite. Despite uh, all these actions, both domestically and internationally at forums such as the UNSC, India went ahead and through 47 presidential orders spanning a 50 year period, uh, 260 of the 395 articles of the Indian constitution were extended to Jammu and Kashmir. The effect of these illegal acts was to put the IIOJK in a dramatically inferior position to other states in India, denying it the special status promised to it by India's constituent assembly. So one may ask that what is it that uh, this recent abrogation of Article 370 has achieved? And in this uh, respect, Badri Raina, uh, an Indian academic, wrote in the Wire India and questioned, what then has the revocation achieved? He goes on to question that perhaps a complete abrogation of democracy in the state and an unconscionable suppression of civil and democratic rights, or perhaps a terminal alienation of the peoples, especially in the valley, from the Republic and its purported vision and promise. This is an Indian author writing in an Indian publication. Then we have uh, the prominent constitutional uh, expert from India, A.G. Nurani, who writes frequently in our newspapers as well, and is the author of, article, of the book, Article 370, A Constitutional History of Jammu and Kashmir. He's called this abrogation move a violation of the procedure, uh, which can be challenged by the Supreme Court. And uh, he goes on to say that this parliament can't abrogate it. This is what the law says. Earlier on in 2017, the Indian Supreme Court in the case of State Bank of India versus Santosh Gupta also observed that even though Article 370 was labeled as a temporary provision and that the Constituent Assembly has been dissolved, the article continues to be in force, thus indicating that it had attained permanent status. Now, of course, we are saying all this, we are discussing all this in the context that you know, we don't agree that the alleged instrument of accession was a correct document or the way India has handled the Kashmir issue domestically through its constitution uh, or, or the constitution of the Constituent Assembly in, in Jammu and Kashmir uh, are all legal steps. But even if they were to be considered for an academic purpose to be so, uh, the recent acts all go against what India set out to do itself as well. And what else has happened since August 5th uh, that we are discussing today? The Indian president issued uh, a series of uh, presidential orders, the first of which was called CO 272, which made some fundamental changes to the Indian constitution in relation to Jammu and Kashmir. The references to the government of Jammu and Kashmir were replaced with a reference to the governor of Jammu and Kashmir. References to the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir were replaced with Legislative Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, the Constitution application to Jammu and Kashmir order of 1954 was superseded with immediate effect. Then uh, it, it, it has achieved various objectives for, for India. Uh, one of which uh, was also uh, that Article 35A became null and void by suppression uh, of, of the above mentioned uh, constitution application to Jammu and Kashmir Order 1954. Article 35A is important to be mentioned here because it protected native Kashmiris from displacement and prevented any attempts to change the demographics of the state by preventing people from other parts of India from buying properties or acquiring a permanent residence certification from the government in order to avail government jobs and so on. So these are the changes that have happened in, 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 in recent past, uh, despite the fact that the Indian Supreme Court and Jammu and Kashmir High Court have consistently discouraged and effectively rejected requests for repeal of Article 370 on the ground that the said article had attained permanence and, and could not be revisited or amended. 
a Pakistani lawyer, Aisha Malik, has uh, argued, uh, you know, in a paper that uh, the current situation constitutes a siege of the IIOJK territory by the Indian forces. And the argument is based on uh, the fact that for a siege to be there, there needs to be isolation uh, of potentially three types, physical, psychological, and electronic. In the case of IIOJK, we see all three in play at the moment. There is physical isolation because as we all know and the world knows uh, that the people of uh, IIOJK, their movements have been restricted. They're not free to move around in the territory at will at the moment. Psycho psychological isolation is there because obviously uh, they are under this psychological pressure of not being in, in contact uh, with their friends and relatives, with civil society organizations, with humanitarian organizations, and feel isolated. And this is also linked to the third type of isolation, the electronic isolation. And the world knows that internet connectivity, telecom connectivity in, in, in IIOJK is negligible at the moment. And then we go on to the international law uh, concept of um, occupation, because we believe that uh, India is an occupying force uh, in, in that territory. Under international law, it's important to understand that occupation is a, is a question of fact. And therefore, the existence of occupation does not depend on a declaration by the occupying power, in this case, India, that it is in occupation or any recognition of the occupation on its part. Uh, to have taken place. And only thing that's required is that the situation meets the defined factual criteria in order for it to be determined as occupation. It is also important uh, that unlike other crimes uh, where uh, intention is important, in this case, the intent of the occupying power does not hold any weight. And occupation has been defined by the International Committee of the Red Cross as when a state exercises an unconsented uh, to effective control over a territory on which it has no sovereign title. And as the UNSC resolutions and Pakistan's consistent position, and in fact, even Indian legislative steps show over time that it does not have sovereign title uh, to the IIOJK territory. There are three specific conditions for an occupation uh, uh, to be in, in, in play. One, the territory uh, which the occupying power uh, is, is occupying, is, it is not entitled to it under international law. That the occupying power is a hostile army and that the occupying power has effective control and exercises authority over the territory. In this case, in the first instance, uh, again, it is clear that the territory is disputed. It is an international dispute and India lacks any uh, authority to take unilateral action in relation to that territory. And uh, I mentioned the Shimla agreement earlier, as well as the instrument of accession and those all relate to, the, uh, to, to strengthen this argument. Hostile army, uh, as I'll mention later on as well, but uh, the, the people of uh, Jammu and Kashmir view uh, Indian forces as an hostile army, as well as other requirements for an hostile army's definition under international law are met in this case. In relation to the third limb uh, of the occupation test, uh, there is no denying that India at the moment has uh, authority and control, illegal control over, over the territory. And in the wall, which is the Palestinian wall advisory opinion, the International Court of Justice has stated that the territory is considered occupied when it is actually placed under the, under the authority of the hostile army and the occupation extends only to the territory where such authority has been established. More than half a million Indian soldiers are occupying IIOJK and exercising this authority. So uh, moving, moving on, uh, it's also important to mention that an occupation is an international armed conflict under common article two of the, uh, to the Geneva Conventions of 1949. And my subsequent speakers will probably shed more light uh, on some of these con concepts. 
in in the context of IIOJK therefore the laws of war which apply to an international armed conflict are applicable to India as an occupying power uh, in particular in relation to the fourth Geneva Convention and this would include the duty to protect the population and to uphold public order and to have a safety obligation to allow and facilitate the rapid and unimpeded passage of human humanitarian relief for civilians in need uh, of uh, and in relation to fundamental human rights. The, this criteria and these requirements are, are not being met by India as an occupying power at this stage. Uh, most relevant to occupations uh, is what I just mentioned, the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, which is relative to the protection of civilian persons in times of war. Uh, and, and this section also imposes a range of obligations on the occupying power, as, as mentioned uh, uh, by me. Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention also prohibits forcible transfers of the civilian pro population from and within occupied territory. Importantly, it also prohibits transfers of population from uh, different parts of India into IIOJK. The abrogation of Article 370 has now allowed any Indian to move to Kashmir and purchase property there, potentially altering the, the demographics of the territory and thus eliminating any chance that a free and fair and impartial plebiscite as required by UNSC resolutions can be held in any, any time in the future. It could be argued that this is a serious violation of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention and amounts to a war crime. And when we, uh, again, I, I believe one of the, the other speakers will speak in more detail about, uh, about this as well. India is also party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The ICCPR prohibits torture and other forms of cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. Article 4 and 7 of the ICCPR explicitly ban torture, even in times of national emergency or when the security of the state is threatened. In this particular case, those requirements are not met. And even then, the Indian Army Special Task Force, Border Security Force, and state-sponsored paramilitary groups and village defense committees, and this is according to Human Rights Watch, uh, that these principal government forces operating in IIOJK has systematically violated these fundamental norms of international human rights law. Human Rights Watch further states that under international law, India's state-sponsored militias are state agents and therefore must abide by international human rights and humanitarian law. The government of India is ultimately responsible for all their actions. In the, in the current environment of COVID-19, it is also important to highlight the humanitarian access requirements uh, Article 59 of the Fourth Geneva Convention states that if any part of the population in any occupied territories is inadequately supplied, then the occupying power is to agree relief schemes on behalf of the population and facilitate them. All parties to uh, the GCs are to permit the free passage of these consignments and guarantee their protection. Rule 56 of the ICRC study on customary international humanitarian law also provides that parties must ensure the freedom of movement of authorized humanitarian relief personnel essential to the exercise of their function unless limited by military necessity. And such limitations are to be temporary uh, and in specific areas and can't be general. Obviously, this is not being done. Reporters Without Borders has said uh, that 8 million Kashmiris continue to be cut off from the absolutely vital information that is needed to prevent the spread of the pandemic. When people under lockdown all over the world are using the internet to work, communicate and get information. The people of IIOJK don't have that access. Finally, I would like to touch upon uh, the concept of genocide. And, and many may argue uh, how that could be relevant in the current context. Uh, but uh, not, not according to any of us, but the global watchdog genocide watch uh, in the post 5th August scenario, uh, there are uh, risk factors for genocide which exist in the case of Kashmir. Uh, it's genocide alert in relation to 
uh, IIOJK states and and uh, <clears throat> and quotes Human Rights Watch as reporting that 50,000 people were killed in Kashmir between 1989 and 2006. It also quotes the Kashmir State Human Rights Commission as having evidence of 2,730 bodies buried and 40 mass graves, and that the commission reported over 8,000 disappearances. It also uh, the, the genocide alert also reports the Jammu and Kashmir coalition of civil society as saying that by 2016, there were over 70,000 killings, mostly by Indian forces. It finally quotes Amnesty International reports that disappearances, torture, and rape by Indian army units against Kashmiri Muslims are common. The, the alert goes on to apply uh, the risk factors for genocide. And, and the following of which are early warnings of massacres in Kashmir. That, as mentioned earlier, the prior genocidal massacres and continuing Im impunity for such killings. There is a continuing armed conflict on the border region between the two countries. There exists an, an exclusionary ideology of Hindutva. There is an authoritarian military rule without legal restraints and war imposed by civilian Indian officials. There is a rule by minority military force over majority Muslim citizens. Uh, the citizens, have, uh, the, uh, the people of IIOJK have been cut off communications and outside access by internet media and trade is being denied. That there have been widespread violations of basic human rights, torture, rape, two year detentions without charge, arbitrary arrests and deportations of Muslim political and human rights leaders are commonplace. The genocide watch 10 stages of the genocidal process are also considered to be a, at a far advanced stage by, uh, by the genocide watch. And, and, and those stages, without going into too much detail, are classification, which is us versus them attitude that the, that the occupying forces have at the moment, symbolization, where Muslims are being specifically identified through their names, attire, and so on, discrimination uh, against the Muslims in this case, Dehumanization, uh, labeling Muslims and creating uh, labels uh, such as terrorists, separatists, or criminals, or insurgents in their case. Organization, with the presence of about 600,000 heavily armed Indian forces in, in the territory. Polarization amongst uh, and within uh, the local population. Preparation, as what uh, the current government in India is calling the final solution for Kashmir. Uh, and persecution, persecution uh, of again uh, the people of IIOJK and uh, potential extermination. And genocidal massacres have occurred uh, during partition since 1990 and there uh, according to Genocide Watch there have been at least 25 massacres with death tolls over 25 uh, in this case. And finally the 10th the, the stage would be denial. Uh, the Indian government uh, likes to portray all the acts that it has taken since 5th August uh, to bring prosperity uh, to, to the territory. That is indeed not the case uh, as, uh, as we have seen. Uh, the people of Kashmir uh, deserve uh, the, the right ensured and, uh, to them and given to them through UNSC resolutions and even earlier on through India's own legal instruments. With that, uh, I would like to th thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this webinar and uh, I'll pass it on back to the organizers or to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very comprehensive um, presentation. I will now request the second speaker, Mr. Shayan Ahmed Khan, to deliver his presentation on human rights violations and legal recourse. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So Mr. Tamul Malik has sort of given us a holistic understanding of the dispute in the context of international law. So I will be focusing on one aspect within that overall context or the broader context of Kashmir, which is the human rights violations and legal recourse that we can adopt in the context of those violations. So if you could go to the next slide. So reshaping the narrative on violations in IIOJK. So because as, and as Mr. Zemur Malik mentioned as well, uh, what we're currently focusing on and what our strategy has been is to focus on human rights violations. However, constantly our position has been that 
the region of Kashmir, uh, IIOJK, is under an occupation. Now, because it is under an occupation, there is a parallel regime to human rights which applies simultaneously with human rights. So as you can see on the screen, the applicable law in peacetime is human rights law and exclusively human rights law. Whereas in the context of an occupation or an armed conflict, the applicable law or the primary applicable law is international humanitarian law. So that is our primary regime which applies in the context of Kashmir. So the primary protections afforded under IHL are those in Geneva Conventions, customary IHL and other bodies of international humanitarian law. Now, when the laws of war are violated, we term them as war crimes and not human rights violations. And if you could go to the next slide, there is in fact a spectrum of violence that we see. So on the one hand, if you see to your left, you see human rights abuses, which are the violations of the treaties ratified by India. So the civil and political rights of the Kashmiris, the social, economic and cultural rights of the Kashmiris, the rights of women in the region, the rights of children in the region. But within the context of an armed conflict, we see that there are a number of violations which can be made out. So the targeting of civilians, murder, torture, forced transfer of population, rape and transfer of one population into occupied territory. Now, these need to be clarified a little bit because in times of war, it is not as if human rights stop applying. So on the one hand, we have violations of war crimes and on the one hand, we have violations of human rights abuses. Now to give you an example, let's say there is a protest which is carrying on, uh, which is being carried out in Kashmir. So one, the police is blocking in, in the means of a law enforcement operation, the police is blocking the right to Kashmiri's freedom of expression. That is a human rights violation. The, the law enforcement or the army starts firing pellet guns at the Kashmiris. That is a human rights violation because it is not in the context of an occupation, but it is within the smaller context of a law enforcement operation, which is being carried out. At the same time, let's say the army goes into someone's house, they pick that person up, and then there are allegations of torture against that person. That would then be categorized as a war crime. Then we have the, on, on the right, you see this thing, which is known as crimes against humanity. Now crimes against humanity and war crimes sort of mirror one another to quite an extent, except that they are more systematized. They're committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population. So whenever human rights abuses or war crimes, whenever they fall to a level where they are so systematic in their nature, or they are so widespread in their nature, then we turn them as crimes against humanity. Now, why is this distinction important? This distinction is important because in order to exercise any legal means or any lawfare means against India, we need to have a proper legal classification based upon which we can take our claim to different legal avenues, which I will be highlighting in the later part of my presentation. So as the gravity increases, the attention which the international community gives to that particular violation increases as well. Now, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So the violations committed in IIOJK. So on the one hand, you are obviously familiar with the violations which are continuous in nature. You are familiar with the instances because you hear them on TV, because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs highlights them on a regular basis. I want to, in this brief presentation, take a different angle and show you some of the things which we have not covered as of yet in an adequate manner. Now, Mr. Tamur Malik has already highlighted the duty of an occupying power in terms of the obligations that they have. Now, even in a pandemic, uh, the duties of an occupying power are multiple. They are to ensure that medical supplies reach the region of Kashmir. They are to ensure that public health is maintained in IIOJK and they are to provide access to humanitarian organizations for relief supplies. So what we need to do is basically, whenever we're talking about uh, COVID-19 in the context of IIOJK, we need to highlight these violations and integrate them into our government statements and say, okay, because India is an occupying power, it has an obligation under the fourth Geneva Convention to do these things. Now, at the same time, and because I mentioned that there are parallel regimes of human rights and IHL, we have international human rights law as well. And Article 12 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights says that the people are to be afforded the highest attainable standard of physical health. 
And currently, the measures imposed in IIOJT are discriminatory as they differ from measures imposed in the rest of India, impeding effective attainment of healthcare in the region. Now, why is this important? And if you go to the next slide, you will see why this is important. Uh, so some interesting facts. Kashmir has 97 ventilators for a population of 7 million, a ratio which is lower than Gaza. There is one doctor for every 3,866 people compared to one ratio 2,000 in the rest of India and the WHO norms of one ratio 1,000 in generally in the world at large. There is no high-speed internet making medical guidelines inaccessible to doctors and work from home difficult. Now, why is it important for us, uh, if you could just go back to the slide for, for one second, thank you. Now, why is this important for us to draw parallels to Gaza? The reason is that those are established positions, there are established legal positions within those regions. We know that international humanitarian organizations we know that international community, whether they speak explicitly for it or not, they recognize Gaza as a conflict zone and they recognize the obligations which apply on Israel. But that is not the case in the context of Kashmir. In fact, many international, uh, many states and many international organizations still do not view uh, the IIOJK as an occupation. They, they think it falls within India and it is in fact a situation of peacetime where only human rights apply. Now that needs to be changed and how can that be changed? By drawing parallels to existing occupations, by drawing parallels to existing conflict zones and showing okay the position in Kashmir is in fact worse than Palestine and that is why the international community needs to talk more about uh, Kashmir and uh, alongside Palestine and that is why it's important for us to draw parallels. Another part of uh, human rights violations is in the next slide which is the grave breaches of the Geneva Convention. Now Mr. Tamur Malik already mentioned that it is prohibited under the fourth Geneva Convention to transfer parts of your population into the occupied territory. Now when that provision is violated what do we call it? We call it a grave breach of the Geneva Convention and in fact Article 147 specifies this. Now why is this important to highlight a grave breach of the Geneva Convention? One, because we are currently protesting uh, the domicile laws which are being passed by India to sort of integrate the Indian population into the region of Kashmir. Now of course we are highlighting this and we are saying that okay this will change the demographics of the region. But what we are forgetting or what we are failing to highlight is that this is an equal violation to let's say torture, it is an equal violation to willful killing and this needs to be highlighted in the context of an occupation, in the context of an armed conflict. And why is this important? Because Article 146 of the Fourth Geneva Convention states, each high contracting party shall be under the obligation to search for persons alleged to have committed or to have ordered to be committed such grave breaches and shall bring such persons, and this is important, regardless of their nationality before its own courts. Which means that if India is failing to prosecute the individuals that are committing these violations, these grave breaches of the Geneva Convention against civilian populations, then the international community at large is under an obligation to prosecute those persons. Now, the Geneva Conventions have global ratifications, which means that almost 190, in fact, more than 190, if my memory serves me correctly, states have ratified this particular instrument. So we need to, in whatever statements that we put out, we need to highlight the obligations, not just on India, but also on the international community to take charge. And as we will discuss in the subsequent parts of this presentation, this concept is known as universal jurisdiction which is an important legal avenue that Pakistan needs to pursue in, in, in regards to the violations that are being committed in IIOJK. If you could go on to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, anyone who's familiar with how law operates, you need to specify the person that you are instituting the case against you need to specify the exact violation or the exact fact, facts which have led to a particular violation. So you need a perpetrator, you need specific instances, and you need 
to accurately classify the crime that person has committed. So you need all three of these things in order to successfully bring any lawfare measures against the people who have committed these violations. Now, how do we do, do that? We do that through ev collecting evidence and conducting fact-finding missions. Now, have they been done before? The answer is yes. Have they been done extensively? The answer is perhaps also yes. So they have been conducted, for example, as recently as 2019 by the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. They have been conducted in 2017, the report of the OIC fact-finding visit to AJK to assess human rights situation in IIOJK. Then we have these excellent reports, which I encourage each and every one of you to go to their website of Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society and see the meticulous detail with which they have documented the persons who were alleged to have committed these acts, the victims, the exact violations, and the progress of cases within Indian domestic courts. So all of this has been mapped out. But this is something which I feel is not being highlighted enough because in our statements, we need to sort of shift the narrative into something very specific. So instead of saying that atrocities are being committed, we need to specify that a particular unit X of Indian armed forces committed these violations against these persons. And currently these are the promises of the case and these are the violations which they have committed. Whenever we start doing that and whenever we, as we progress through this phase, we start linking them to prior violations and start building sort of a systematicity in, in the violations which are being committed in the region. And that is in fact the thing which will sort of draw international community to Kashmir and say, okay, these violations are very systematic in nature and Pakistan is presenting a, a plethora of evidence. These impartial organizations are presenting a plethora of evidence and that will then force international community to act and how they will act. I will uh, sort of outline that in the subsequent parts of the presentation, but just to sort of go forward to the next slide. Now, this is what we need to do. We need to highlight the alleged perpetrators and make indictments against them. Now, for example, the seven Rashtriya rifles, as you can see on, on um, the left side of the screen, we have the seven Rashtriya rifles committing uh, acts of abduction and extrajudicial killings against these people and FIRs have been filed and there has been blanket impunity to the armed forces and uh, if you could go to the next slide and this is similarly being done by the border security force as well so this is what we need to do we need to be specific whenever we're talking about abductions tortures and forced disappearances in order for us to specifically institute legal or lawfare options against the Indian forces and individuals. If you could go to the next slide, please. So developing narrative and building public pressure. So anyone who's familiar with international law would agree that in order to specifically or in order to properly leverage international law, there is a requirement that there be a political backing of those statements. And there is a requirement that there is enough public pressure that the governments are forced to act. Now, going to the next slide, uh, we see that this is something we need to do. Currently, there is a lack of organic discussion being committed uh, or sort of being conducted in international media about the situation in Kashmir. And from a legal standpoint, whenever this discussion takes place, there is, yes, a discussion of uh, the right to self-determination. In fact, nobody denies that the, the Kashmiris have a right to self-determination. The problematic part in this area is that there is, isn't as of yet a consensus on an occupation within the region. That is something that we need to talk about. That is something that we need to take up with international media. We need to take it up with international human rights movements, humanitarian organizations, think tanks, policy analysts, and scholars to start making a case for an occupation so that we can gather a broader spectrum of crimes, we can trigger the applicability of the Geneva Conventions to say to the international community that you have an obligation to now protect the right of the Kashmiris and it's not just an obligation which is incumbent upon India. So then we need to start movements such as the BDS movement uh, in, in the context of Palestine in foreign universities and we need to proliferate the message of Kashmir, the legal message of Kashmir as far and wide, because until we have political backing, 
and until we have public pressure from the people it will be of course difficult to deploy lawfare means against uh, india for the actions that they are committing in the region next slide please right moving to the legal avenues so i have already highlighted the importance of fact finding and i have already uh, sort of listed out the entities which have uh, taken part and which have collected evidence in a meticulous amount of details but what else can we do in terms of fact finding matters we can approach the un now how do we do that so uh, if you go to the next slide i have highlighted some of the 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 means that we can take place Uh, so the UN Human Rights Council, for example, they can constitute independent investigative mechanisms, commissions of inquiries, and fact-finding missions, which requires the resolution uh, to be passed by the Human Rights Council through a simple majority out of 47 states. Now, currently, if uh, anyone's been following the news, we, we've seen that the OIC and Turkey have uh, sort of supported us in the Human Rights Council, and there were some videos as well, in fact, where where our uh, ambassador was highlighting these particular violations which were taking place. So we need to take that momentum. We need to carry that momentum forward and try and pass a resolution. In fact, in terms of the independent investigative mechanisms, there is one that is currently on Myanmar and. Uh, one of the problems which i anticipate with these fact finding missions is access now we know that there is at least right now india will not be willing to provide any fact finding mission access to india however that is not a problem because even in the case of myanmar the investigative mechanisms are being conducted remotely meaning that they are interviewing victims that uh, civil societies from those regions are approaching these investigative mechanisms the mechanism is then approaching facebook for the videos that were sort of put out by by the government of myanmar and they are collecting that data remotely and the use of that data remotely is now being seen before the international court of justice where it, the gambia has instituted a case against myanmar based upon the evidence which was collected by the independent investigative mechanism and that is something we need to push for we need to have an impartial un mechanism which can collect evidence on kashmir and the violations that are taking place when enough uh, of this evidence is collected it will be very very difficult for states to deny that okay particular violations are taking place they know that those violations are taking place but they still have some leeway in terms of us or in terms of uh, there being sort of a lack of evidence or the presentation of that evidence before those forums however when we have an impartial entity like the independent investigative mechanism under the human rights council it will be very hard for those particular states to deny those violations now some of the low hanging fruits what are those so the special rapporteur on torture which is mandated to undertake fact finding country visits and to transmit urgent appeals to states with regards to individuals reported to be at risk of torture and or to communicate past alleged cases of torture so the special rapporteur has been very very critical of the activities of india already very very critical of the activities of india which are taking place in iojk on 4th may 2020 the special rapporteur sent a letter to india to look into allegations of torture within iojk on 5th august 2020 the special rapporteur tweeted the following and this is important for a straight four years every year i have formally requested to meet the ambassador of india at un geneva to discuss an official fact finding visit to the country including jammu and kashmir in line with the special rapporteur's torture ma mandate i have not even received a response not once now we see that nils melzer the special rapporteur on torture is already willing to look into the violations of torture which are being committed we know that india will not provide him a, a visit in person but we can facilitate as part of his mandate his duties how can we do that we can build linkages wherein we facilitate the victims to sort of reach the special rapporteur and to explain the situation there we can build linkages of the civil societies like the jkccs to this to the special rapporteur and say okay the jkccs has collected this evidence and you need to start looking into this evidence so we need to facilitate in accordance with this mandate 
the mandate of the special rapporteur can be fulfilled even remotely and this is something we need to look into in a similar fashion to the working group on arbitrary detention now going to the next slide uh, so uh, shifting from geneva to the un secretariat in new york i personally think it is very difficult for us to uh, sort of get fact finding mandates or get fact finding missions approved through the un general assembly due to a political consensus the un security council due to uh, a veto the secretary general due to sort of the the whole context where the secretary general has not been willing to take a bold position on this stance but high commissioner for human rights is probably of, of course sits in geneva not in new york but the high commissioner of human rights has been constantly conducting remote monitoring of the situation and we need to facilitate whatever the high commissioner for human rights is doing we need to from 2019 to 2020 if the high commissioner is planning on putting out a report on azad jammu and kashmir and iiojk we need to provide him with evidence to sort of highlight that okay these are the violations taking place and this is undeniable evidence which is there for us or there for the international community to see now having talked about the importance of evidence and the fact finding missions what lawfare means can we deploy that is in the subsequent slides which i'll be discussing now uh, if you could go to the next slide so the implementation mechanism so the first one is to bring an interstate complaint under the international convention on all forms of racial discrimination now uh, miss sadia the subsequent speaker will obviously be highlighting that there is a paucity of interstate mechanisms or judicial institutions which can be engaged in the context of kashmir but this is one such mechanism that is currently or that we can currently invoke against india now how can we do that kashmiris are recognized as a distinct race under the cert convention this has been categorically stated by the cert committee in 1996 that kashmiris are a distinct group based on their ethnic or national origin now the cert committee has already recognized that the atrocities being committed under the guard of security and counter insurgency in the region of jammu and kashmir are targeted towards kashmiris specifically local remedies are inapplicable now what do they mean by the concept of local remedies so in order to bring a claim under article 11 it is required that whatever violations are in question have been taken all the way to the indian supreme court however this is not the case when there are systematic violations taking place and that is why i lay emphasis on the importance of us sort of highlighting and categorizing systematic violations systematic violations like torture or sort of violence on civilians uh, because when there is a level of systematicity uh, the rule of exhaustion of local remedies is inapplicable where there has been a sustained campaign of racial discrimination carried out through acts repeated over an appreciable period of time now does pakistan have standing to bring a claim because under international law normally what happens is you need to be injured or there needs to be a violation against your rights in order for you to bring an interstate complaint or an interstate dispute under international law but there are exceptions that exception is known as an obligation or gongs an obligation or gongs is, is basically an obligation on the international community as a whole now in order to prevent racial discrimination all member states have an obligation or gongs to stop racial discrimination and that gives pakistan or any other state in the world party to the cert to bring an interstate complaint against india for the violations that are being committed now we know that highlighting the violations or seeing what violations are being committed will not be an uphill task because day in day out there are a number of atrocities which are being committed the rights of the kashmiris in terms of their civil and political rights in terms of their social cultural and economic rights are constantly being violated which fall within the purview of the cert now this is one option that we can institute in fact immediately and uh, if we go to the next slide there are subsequent other mechanisms which we can invoke as well now uh, recently i don't know if you've uh, had the chance to go over this particular instance but uh, the indian uh, forces were going to go to israel for counter insurgency training in israel and what happened there uh, uh, citizens or civilians from israel uh, 
uh, filed a petition before the Israeli Supreme Court and they said that these persons are involved in certain activities and they must not be allowed access to these trainings or to, to Israel generally. And then this became an issue which blew up over media. Now, this is very one small instance that has taken place. There are a number of things which we can do, which are obviously much greater in scale. Now, what can we do? We can invoke domestic mechanisms which are found in the US, Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, the European Union, and a number of other states. Now, what are those mechanisms? So, taking the example of United States, we have the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, which allows the president to impose US entry and sanctions against foreign persons or entities. We have the Foreign Assistance Act, which stops security assistance to countries or governments that engage in gross human rights violations. We have Section 620M of the Foreign Assistance Act, which requires the United States government to stop rendering any assistance to a unit of the security forces if the Secretary of State has credible information for grave human rights abuses. And then we have Section 116 of the Foreign Assistance Act 1961, which enables the United States government to withhold developmental assistance. Now, some of you might be wondering, okay, because it's the president, because of this, it's the secretary of state, would they be willing to impose sanctions on India generally? The answer is yes and no. Uh, at present, I, I think it would be less likely uh, for such violations to sort of be put forward in terms of the context of India. But we can very easily make a case, let's say, against the border security force, let's say the seventh Rashtriya Rifles, who we have concrete evidence against. And in those contexts, these states are never hesitant to impose sanctions. So if it's sanctions against individuals, if it's sanctions against units, these states are readily willing to impose sanctions. And that is what we need to do as a starting point before we start going to the high level, let's say, where we we go for uh, a particular minister, we go for a major general, we need to start aiming for the low hanging fruits and sort of go first to these units, which we know are directly involved in these violations. And then we of course have uh, particular mechanisms in Canada, Australia, and United Kingdom, which are similar. And if you go to the next slide, uh, next slide please. Yeah, so universal jurisdiction. Now, I talked about this in the beginning as well. This is perhaps something which is very, very important to us. Now, what is universal jurisdiction? It allows states to try to assert jurisdiction over persons irrespective of their nationality and country of residence if they have committed grave human rights abuses, war crimes, and or crimes against humanity. Within the region of IOK, the armed forces of, uh, under the Special Powers Act, AFSPA, and the Jammu and Kashmir Public Safety Act, they have been provided a legal cover for the atrocities that they commit uh, in the region. The Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights noted that in the nearly 28 years that the AFSPA has been in force, there has not been a single prosecution for the atrocities committed in the region. Now then, that means we can invoke mechanisms of universal jurisdiction against these particular entities. Now, universal jurisdiction is not an alien concept. It is, in fact, being utilized on a very constant basis just to review the activities which took place in this context. And from 2019 to 2020, there were prosecutions in 16 countries. There were 11 accused on trial. There were 16 convictions. There were 207 suspects. There were 146 crimes against humanity charges, 141 crime, uh, war crime charges, and 92 torture charges. Now, this is important. So at one point in time, there are some states which require that the perpetrator or the perpetrator that we identify be in the presence of that particular country for them to institute uh, a particular case in universal jurisdiction. So let's say if we've highlighted a colonel in the army, that colonel needs to be in Switzerland or in Germany in order for the Swiss or German authorities to institute a case against him. So that is one option where we, we need to identify perpetrators and track where they are going. And as soon as they reach those territories, we immediately get in touch with the prosecutorial entities in those particular countries and file a claim under universal jurisdiction. That is one option. Another option is to go to states like Argentina who do not require such a territorial presence and who are willing to uh, carry out these investigations even without a territorial presence. So all that needs to be done 
is that a claim be filed by the victims or any NGO on behalf of the victims before the Federal Court of Argentina and the mechanisms for universal jurisdiction commence. Now, what does that do if they do not have custody of the, of the particular perpetrator? Well, that is an interesting point because then the Argentinian government or the Argentinian courts start exercising mutual legal assistance mechanisms wherein they approach different countries uh, to gather evidence. They start invoking extradition mechanisms where let's say if a particular colonel is in a country where there is an extradition agreement between Argentina and state X, Argentina will then request extradition for that particular person. So that is something that we need to aggressively look forward to. And it's not the fact that Pakistan necessarily has to do this, but Pakistan can facilitate this process as well. And how can Pakistan do that? That is uh, discussed in the subsequent slide. Documentation of evidence and fact finding needs to be done, of course. Then the cases can be instituted by victims and or their families or NGOs on behalf of the victims. Now we need to build linkages of domestic civil societies and victims with international NGOs which specialize in universal jurisdiction. They provide pro bono services, they have services in different countries and they are in fact the people who have instigated a number of uh, claims successfully so under universal jurisdiction. Now what are they? Trial International, the Center for Justice and Accountability, International Federation for Human Rights and Redress. So to conclude in the next slide, uh, we, we, this is what we need, need to do. Obviously the process isn't as neat as I've made it out, but generally these are some of the things which we need to be mindful of in order to have a legal recourse against the violations being committed. So we need to document specific in instances. At the same time, simultaneously, we need to develop campaigns, media campaigns to build awareness. We need to engage with NGOs and IOs that are documenting these violations already, build linkages of civil societies, then we need to incorporate legal language into government statements. So for example, India has been arguing on the premise of terrorism that, okay, Pakistan is harboring terrorists, which are then committing activities in, in IIOJK. Now that is a lawfare move that India deployed against us. Then they, they, there was it attributed to the gray listing, which occurred now there, there were mechanisms in this UN security council, which were engaged, but Pakistan, uh, was not able to drive the legal narrative of it being an indigenous freedom struggle, which is, which operates in, in, to put it in layman language as an exception to the terrorism, because they are fighting for the right to self-determination. They're not causing terror within the population as in a, in a means that India puts it. So it is very important for us to incorporate legal language into government statements to build pressure, legal pressure on India for these violations. As I mentioned in the context of Gaza, we need to draw parallels to other self-determination movements. And then finally, once all that is done, we need to aggressively pursue for the UN fact-finding mandates and then deploy implementation mechanisms. And that is it from my side. I give the floor back to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shayan, for an extremely informative uh, presentation. I will now request the third speaker of the session, Dr. Sadia Zahu, to deliver her talk on Kashmir and international judicial legal institutions. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much uh, for having me. It's such a tall order to follow Mr. Temur and my friend Shayan, uh, and particularly Shayan, who has given such an extensive uh, presentation and talk on issues, uh, especially human rights violations. And uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, you may continue. It's perfectly fine. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, obviously, um, I do not. I, I do not. Do not have full uh, knowledge of the uh, consideration that our um, stakeholders have or the limitation that our stakeholders are following uh, or facing. But I will discuss this important issue that, you know, people are like constantly asking individually and uh, on media that why Pakistan is not invoking ICJ's jurisdiction or ICC's jurisdiction with regard to Kashmir issue. Uh, so I'm purely discussing this issue academically. Uh, but before I start that, I want to qualify my talk um, in two, by stating two things. One, first is that we have to understand that um, invoking a jurisdiction of a court is not purely a legal issue. 
is also a diplomatic and a political issue as well because you need a certain amount of political support or political support of international institutions and international actors to invoke uh, at least some sort of um, some uh, sort of jurisdiction of some uh, institutions secondly it is one thing to invoke a jurisdiction of uh, international judicial institution and it's totally different to discuss the merit of the case um, so today uh, i will be discussing the jurisdictional issue and not the merit of the case Perhaps some of the elements of the merit of the case are discussed by Barrister Temur and Shayan in their talks, um, where they have highlighted the Indian violation, which will subsequently uh, can become the basis for the um, proceedings in international judicial um, institutions. Um, for the first thing, uh, I will start with ICJ. Um, so, that, um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, we'll be discussing ICJ and ICC and uh, ICJ has two sort of jurisdictions. One is contentious jurisdiction and second is advisory opinion jurisdiction. Um, and we'll first be discussing the contentious jurisdiction. So you might uh, please go to the next slide. So we can invoke the contentious jurisdiction of the ICJ in three ways. That is first is a special agreement. Second is acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction by states. Uh, and third is it the international treaties and conventions with the compromissory clauses. So the first we have to discuss the special agreement way of invoking ICJ's jurisdiction. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we can see that um, special agreements um, to invoke the ICJ's jurisdiction uh, are possible under Article 36 of the ICJ statute. However, we have to understand that India and Pakistan both have to give their consent to conclude such an agreement. And no such agreement is uh, available in between India and Pakistan and I think in these hostile circumstances it's almost impossible for both states to come together and conclude an agreement uh, to refer the Kashmir issue uh, to ICJ. So um, we have seen that you know previously almost more than 18 cases have been filed in ICJ on the basis of such special agreements including the North Continental Sea Shelf case however and many others However, um, with regard to India and Pakistan, this seems like a non-option, non-starter, because um, it's very difficult to get India to give a consent uh, on this particular issue. However, um, this is theoretical, a possible, th theoretical possibility. If ever we go to um, negotiation with India and at any stage, we can actually put this on table. Or if there is a uh, mediation by international forces, we can uh, put this um, on the table that you know, if India is like really um, feels that it has a strong case, why not opt for ICJ's um, jurisdiction and decide this legally? And Pakistan should put forward this, not only because Pakistan has a strong legal case, but also because Pakistan should make this narrative that Pakistan is a law-abiding state which is willing to follow international law and international practice and, to, and is willing to settle its dispute peacefully through international legal uh, forums. So I think this is an important uh, point to, uh, for this, our stakeholders uh, to remember while ever we uh, in negotiation with international um, actors or with India directly uh, for any discussion or negotiation on Kashmir. If you can go to the next slide, we can talk about um, compulsory jurisdiction. So ICJ um, has this mechanism where uh, you, states who have signed the or have been ratified the uh, statute of the ICJ can actually uh, opt for an optional um, declaration uh, of a compulsory uh, for accepting compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ. And India and Pakistan both have submitted their declaration accepting the compulsory jurisdiction. However, both of them have submitted a, so, such a watertight declaration and uh, later on amended those declarations also to make them further watertight. Um, Pakistan has done that in 2017, perhaps after um, um, the case, a nuclear weapons case um, um, in the March of 2017. Um, but, um, Marshall Islands case, sorry. So, um, and added the national security narrative into it. Um, but India has also done, uh, amended its declaration for the third time in 2019, uh, after fifth acts of 5th August, and has included not only included national security or interpretation of the multilateral treaties, which is party to, which India is party to, and also um, with regard to the amendment and termination of the declaration at any possible time uh, through notification. So uh, India already had a very wide and um, 
comprehensive declaration which has excluded the ICJ's jurisdiction on certain issues, including the dispute between any common uh, current or former co Commonwealth countries and, and any dispute with regard to territorial and frontier disputes. Now it has added additional things to its reservation with regard to national security and interpretation of any treaty. And um, even if some states still uh, can um, breach into the um, declaration, India has put this point forward that you know at any time they can devote their uh, acceptance of uh, compulsory jurisdiction um, so india's declaration has uh, effectively um, pre prevented any state from invoking um, compulsory jurisdiction declaration against india and the german professor uh, christian thomas schach has said that india has like um, in, in ICJ's commentaries, he has mentioned that India's act is a veiled act of non-acceptance. So India has accepted and in a way not accepted uh, or comprehensively prevented any state from invoking uh, ICJ's jurisdiction based on their uh, India's uh, declaration of compulsory jurisdiction. So in this particular case, I think it's almost impossible for Pakistan um, to file a uh, case against India on the basis of the compulsory jurisdiction. We have to understand that Pakistan has unsuccessfully tried this in Atlantic case in 1999, but um, ICJ did not um, adhere uh, to our comments um, or our requests. So if you can go to the next slide. So this is a third way, a third option for invoking ICJ's jurisdiction. I really want to discuss this um, because after um, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar case, Gambia versus Myanmar case, everybody was thinking that why Pakistan is not taking India to ICJ under the Genocide Convention as Myanmar has done, which is a smaller country in comparison to Pakistan, or why Pakistan is not uh, using or requesting Myanmar to take such an action against India. We have to understand that Myanmar has taken, um, Gambia has taken Myanmar against, um, uh, taken, uh, Myanmar to ICJ uh, on the basis of the Genocide Convention on the Compromissary Clause of the Genocide Convention. So what is a Compromissary Clause? It's a, a clause that, that gives the jurisdiction to ICJ on the basis of the particular treaty, multilateral or bilateral, um, where ICJ has given a jurisdiction to discuss uh, issues of that particular convention or a treaty. So on the basis of the Genocide Convention, um, Gambia has filed a case against Myanmar because both the states have signed Genocide Convention and both the states have uh, put no reservation on the Compromissary Clause that was Article 9. However, in case of India and Pakistan, they mostly signed these multilateral agreements or bilateral agreements but with the reservation uh, on the Compromissary Clause. For example, the, like some of the important uh, one convention particularly that Cheyenne has discussed uh, is a third. Um, so we can go to the committee because there is no reservation or the reservation is not allowed on the, uh, on the uh, committee procedures. However, with regard to ICJ, both India and Pakistan have put a reservation on the um, Compromissary Clause. So Pakistan cannot take um, on the similar grounds, Pakistan cannot take India to ICJ. S same is the case for the Genocide Convention. Same is the case for the Terrorist Bombing Convention. Um, so mostly India and Pakistan both have put reservation, but India has been more cautious and has put more reservation on almost all sort of uh, international conventions. However, I'm not saying that I have done an extensive research or anybody in Pakistan has set, seen every single treaty since Permanent Court of Justice and have seen and all come to the conclusion that India has signed um, um, as put resolution on every single um, uh, convention. However, all the relevant conventions that we can see uh, have seen India has a reservation on that. So India and Pakistan have no bilateral at this particular moment, no relevant bilateral or multilateral treaty uh, on the basis of which Pakistan can invoke the ICJ's jurisdiction. Some people have mistakenly quoted um, a Shimla agreement uh, often as a basis for the ICJ's jurisdiction, I want to clarify that Shimla agreement has no compromissory clause and ICJ cannot uh, have the jurisdiction on the Kashmir issue on the basis of this bilateral agreement. So there has to be a, um, or then there is a question that, you know, if they have put a reservation on something like genocide convention, isn't it against the international norms and obligation on India for not committing uh, genocide? Um, so this, 
without taking into consideration whether India is committing a genocide or whether we have this uh, evidence to prove that whether India is committing genocide or not, I want to clarify that uh, ICJ in its judgment in Congo versus Rwanda has said that you know they cannot um, invoke these obligations uh, in the presence of a, a um, reservation by one country because the international system, international judicial system in particular works on the basis of the state consent. And if they do not have state consent or all the state has put a reservation on the compromise clause, it's almost impossible uh, for ICJ to entertain such an application against the state. So Pakistan can also not file a contentious case against India on the basis of these three mechanisms. Um, perhaps Pakistan can go and file a case, but uh, that case will not be entertained because unlike our domestic courts, we need a consent of India for, uh, or for that matter, any other country um, to invoke the ICJ's jurisdiction. So we, as I said earlier, it is very important to understand that the legal system uh, and the political system structure of the international institutions um, go hand in hand and we cannot go over and above that. Uh, however, with regard to compromisory clauses, we should do more research, more extensive research. There are many international treaties that uh, we have to study uh, to find out any loophole, possible loophole for Pakistan to make a lawfare move against India. However, uh, on the um, on the basis of the, my own research, I say there are hardly any possibility for Pakistan uh, to invoke such a jurisdiction, uh, such a uh, jurisdiction of ICJ on the basis of such a clause. If you can move to the next slide, please. So the next thing is um, advisory opinion of the ICJ. So I do understand the advisory opinion of the ICJ is not open to the states. Also, the findings of the advisory opinion, uh, although the advisory opinion itself is not binding on the states. However, because the advisory opinion comes from the highest judicial body, it has its own significance. And if this gets any um, opinion against India, it will be of high, uh, it has the same importance or maybe more than the way we have the UN Security Council uh, resolution that we have against India. So how can we um, invoke the advisory jurisdiction of the ICJ? We, we can, uh, as a state, we cannot, but we can uh, request the UN Security Council or General Assembly um, to and forward a resolution for seeking advisory opinion from the ICJ. If we can move to the next slide again. Uh, the question here is uh, more uh, of a political strength or diplomatic strength of Pakistan than the legal question here because um, for UN security, for passing a resolution from UN Security Council asking for the advisory opinion, seeking the advisory opinion of the ICJ, we need not only the support of the majority of the members of the UN Security Council, but also the uh, consent, uh, cons uh, consent of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. So we have to see, and only I think uh, perhaps um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the right position to assess the position of Pakistan, whether Pakistan can win the majority vote. Uh, and especially the uh, consent of five former members to refer any resolution seeking advisory opinion on the Kashmir issue. With regard to the UN General Assembly, it is slightly e easier process because um, unlike UN Security Council, um, as Pakistan is not currently a member of UN Security Council, and in India is about to take a seat in the UN Security Council, uh, we, we can actually, Pakistan can itself move a resolution in UN General Assembly seeking the advisory opinion. Um, however, we have to understand that it's not a simple issue because we need not only the majority vote, but once the, the resolution is passed, um, the question, the legal question that we can ask, again, there's a confusion among, about, in, among people that, you know, Pakistan can ask any question. No, we can only about ask a legal question. So we cannot ask about the political or the historical stance that, you know, India and Pakistan both disagree on with regard to Kashmir. So what, what is what should be that legal question? What is an appropriate legal question? I think that is the one thing that you know interests most international law students and practitioners. Um, um, Pakistan has to do an extensive research. Pakistan probably will have to hire uh, the best legal man in the world to find out to determine whether Pakistan, what sort of question Pakistan should ask. But obviously that is after Pakistan can determine whether they have the requisite votes in the UN General Assembly. However, there's one more uh, condition that Pakistan has to consider but when, once the resolution has been passed, it has to, the question itself goes back to um, International Law Commission uh, for the formulation of the question that might not be, and the final product might not be the way Pakistan wish it to be. So these considerations are important for Pakistan to understand. However, there is another way Pakistan should approach this uh, advisory opinion um, option is through international organizations. So, <clears throat> 
um, UN General Assembly and Security Council can seek advisory opinion of the ICJ. Along with that, 15 specialized agencies can also, through UN Security Council and General Assembly, can seek advisory opinion. And Pakistan should work with those countries, uh, those organizations expanded is being um, reached by India in uh, under the, uh, for example, UNSF or UNESCO, the culture, heritage, health, uh, education, as Shaya has discussed extensively during his talk, that we should talk about, uh, we should lobby with those international organizations and see if those international organizations can seek advisory opinion of. Uh, ICJ on Kashmir issue with regard to their own mandate and this happened before um, uh, in the past it happened and it can happen again but Pakistan has to lobby with these international organizations and first uh, do a comprehensive study what sort of mandate uh, or which uh, organizations mandates have been uh, breached by India during the occupation. Um, if we can move to the next slide. With regard to ICC, we have to understand that the Rome Statute um, has established the ICC, um, but both India and Pakistan are not member to the uh, of the Rome Statute and are not member of the ICC. So it's not that easy for India or Pakistan to invoke the jurisdiction of ICC like a member state. However, it's not that that uh, Pakistan is without any option with regard to ICC. So um, for those who are um, slightly maybe not uh, aware of the difference between the ICJ and ICC. So, so IC, ICJ, uh, in ICJ, only states can go against other states. However, with regard to ICC, the prosecution is against an individual criminal or an individual accused. So here it is more appropriate um, with regard to all the violations or all the crimes that uh, war crime or crime against humanity or genocide, um, genocidal act that India and Indian forces are committing in India, uh, ICC might seem more appropriate for them. However, uh, as Pakistan and India both are not member of the <coughs> ICC, Pakistan is left with only two choices uh, for invoking the ICC's jurisdiction. The first is UN Security Council referral again, uh, and the second is state declaration. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, we have to understand again, uh, with regard to UN Security Council referral, it is a possibility because it happened, already happened for um, in Libya's case, um, in Darfur's case. Um, so in, however, uh, we have to see whether, um, is it a possible possibility now because now the US has a very strained relationship with ICC itself. UN Security Council itself has a very complex relation with ICC because even when they in previous cases in Libya's and Sudan's cases they have referred a situation to ICC and uh, they failed to commit any financial support to ICC and now with the um, additional um, sanctions uh, on ICC by and ICC officials by US it's extremely difficult perhaps to invoke a UN Security Council referral uh, option for Pakistan. However, under Article 13b, theoretically, UN Security Council can um, uh, refer the situation to ICC. However, what Shayan has correctly mentioned, and I cannot emphasize more on it, which is that, you know, we have to keep on highlighting those uh, situ uh, situation and violation in Kashmir to, um, to make this narrative that, you know, what is happening in Kashmir is equally, if not more um, gruesome, what is happening in Palestine, in what happened in Sudan, what happened in Libya. So um, so that, you know, world can draw parallels. However, the threat of veto um, is a prime concern for Pakistan or should be prime concern for Pakistan. Um, and again, this is more of a diplomatic question or political uh, stature mm -hmm. of Pakistan, which is in question rather than a legal question. Legally, this is a possibility uh, or possibly a possible legal option. However, we also have to understand once the situation is referred to ICC, every single actor involved in that political situation will be subject to uh, investigation. Um, and uh, I might not add more to it, but I think I have referred uh, to the possible consequences uh, of such a situation, if ever um, referred by a UN Security Council. And if we can move to the next slide. In the end, uh, I want to discuss this um, international um, ICC's jurisdiction where a non state party can make a declaration and accept the ICC's jurisdiction for a particular issue as a non member state. And that means that without signing the or uh, ratifying the Rome Statute, we, are, we can give our consent for a particular situation and refer the particular situation uh, to 
um, ICC. However, the, uh, and in the past, countries have done that, including Palestine um, and Ukraine uh, against Russia. However, there, um, as uh, China has mentioned, but this, the amount of support that Palestine gathers internationally um, is Kashmir do not have a similar support. Um, also, the situation is very different, perhaps uh, even legally speaking, because uh, the situation in Palestine is cons the territories in Palestine are considered to be occupied territories, unlike the territory uh, of Kashmir, um, which we, we do believe as a, as Pakistan is an occupied territory, but. Legally speaking, we do not have any ICJ advisory opinion or U.S. Security Council calling it a, 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 an occupied territory. Yes, it has been declared by U.S. Security Council as a disputed territory. So we have to see whether, uh, even if the Pakistan accepts uh, or refers the situation to ICC under Article 23, whether uh, ICC have similar reaction the way they have with regard to Palestine and Ukraine. Also, we have to understand that both of the cases are in the preliminary stages. And uh, perhaps we still have to wait for the jurisprudence to develop in that particular uh, aspect because both in terms of Ukraine and uh, Palestine, both have referred uh, occupied territory uh, or the crime committed in the occupied territory to ICC. Also, we have to understand that Pakistan um, has an effective control on AJK. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, under this declaration, uh, with regard to already developed juris uh, jurisprudence, Pakistan can only refer situation uh, in the AJK or the area under its control. However, the intensity of crimes committed by India on the border, which is like border shelling and killing of innocent civilians, might not, um, might not, in my opinion, amount to the uh, fulfill the criteria mentioned in Article 17 of the Rome Statute of the intensity. Um, so perhaps they are committing crimes, but not every single crime or inter every single violation of uh, international law um, falls into the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of uh, international uh, criminal court. However, with regard to referring the whole of the situation of Jammu and Kashmir as an occupied territory, um, this this is something which would be the case of first impression. That means that this is a case which have not been detained by ICC before. So that would be a risky option. But um, with regard to um, how Pakistan um, do not have any clear option with, uh, to taking um, India to any international judicial forum. Pakistan should study this option and um, seek advice uh, and by for invoking this juris, uh, this option um, under the Rome Statute. Uh, I want to thank you all and um, for having me, and I hope that I have uh, briefly discussed all the important questions with regard to ICJ and ICC. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for a very informative presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we um, are still expecting uh, Mr. Amr Bilal Sufi to join us for his concluding address. Unfortunately, he's caught up with some uh, official commitments due to which um, he's not joined us so far. Uh, so in the meantime, what we'll do is that we'll start with the Q&A session uh, and start the discussions. We've got uh, quite a few uh, interesting questions that I've received. Um, I'll request uh, Lieutenant General uh, Naim Khalid Lodi to take the floor uh, to ask the first questions if he'd like to share his comments with us. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I hope everybody can listen to me. Listen to me. Uh, I think uh, I find myself uh, particularly lucky uh, to be listening to our three speakers. Uh, Taimur Shayan and Saadiya Saiba, and uh, uh, it was a total, uh, I would say, a, a, a great uh, bouquet of uh, uh, you know, options that uh, we can uh, exercise, or at least we have the potential to exercise them. Uh, many of these things, uh, at least I didn't know, and I'm sure that uh, all those who, are, uh, who, do, who want to do anything for Kashmir, uh, they, they must uh, have all this on their table. And I'm sure that uh, IPRI will compile all these uh, things and then present it to the uh, uh, you know, appropriate people. What I've understood is that mm, without a combined effort, uh, things will not move. And uh, the mother of everything is uh, international politics, as it, it appeared again and again. That, uh, so which means that foreign office has to be uh, the focal ministry as far as you know, furthering of all these things are concerned. But they will have to take... Uh, you know, full assistance from law ministry, uh, from our uh, these international uh, 
uh, you know law um, uh, lawyers they, they know so well about uh, so many aspects government of ajk must uh, become very agile and active uh, they should uh, also be uh, a party or probably they uh, they should lead instead of foreign office that can be decided media has come up uh, you know once we talk of international opinions and international communities and their pressure so i i can understand that so it it is what i have understood is it is a hybrid you know effort which will have to be made otherwise uh, uh, you know just the uh, may not succeed uh, of course uh, we have to keep in mind that even uh, uh, even if we succeed in all these things that is uh, uh, we uh, we impress the you know foreign opinion and uh, uh, our uh, diplomacy is also uh, fruitful which is, which is in a way in a lot many ways and uh, this politics and lawfare still uh, we we have seen that uh, countries admin countries like uh, uh, israel uh, they don't listen to anything uh, in spite of all this you know uh, all these uh, things so the indigenous struggle um, uh, of kashmiris is very important and also uh, the way pakistan supports uh, the kashmiri people uh, uh, that is also very important uh so uh, the the political side uh, the psychological side the military sides all these things they have to play a role uh, otherwise these things will uh, not fo- move forward uh so uh, i i would just like to uh, put one question to all the uh, three speakers and they can uh, make up the divide who would like to answer that uh, nowadays it, uh, it is very current uh, you know in, in the last few days that we are trying to uh, do some some status changes in uh, gilgit baltistan and maybe later on in ajk also so from the international law point of view uh, how should we proceed i mean uh, we know that uh, for example gilgit baltistan you must all be knowing all the three speakers that uh, they got their freedom uh, through their own struggle uh, without any help and then they immediately decided to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, go with pakistan but still then later on karachi agreement and all that un resolution so it, they were appended with uh, kashmir and i i my question is that even if we have to make gilgit baltistan as a province of pakistan or azad kashmir as a province of pakistan uh, what is the uh, you know best way to proceed for that uh, for example i have in my mind that we should first ask uh, un uh, united nations to carry out partial plebiscite under their auspices in these two regions and ask the people uh, the question which is uh, there in the united nations security council uh, of course for that uh, india will not uh, agree and then there will be a problem then what should be our second uh, you know option of doing it rather than straight away going for elections and uh, you know doing it unilaterally so i would ask this very vital question that what our uh, you know these uh, experts would like to suggest to us that uh, we cannot uh, keep these people in limbo for 70 years they are, they are saying that give us seats in um, national assembly and give us seat in senate and all that and i think that is their legitimate uh, 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 claim but we must do it in a way that it is palatable as far as international law is concerned thank you very much thank you sir um, i would uh, request uh, maybe dr sadia to uh kindly shed some light on um defen general harid nain lodi's uh, comment and his question thank you so much um i would just say that you know uh, he rightly pointed out that the situation of gilgit baltistan is different from that of uh, azad jammu and kashmir um that's true it is also true that historically during the part, during especially during the partition uh, the situation was um, situation turned into something which made a gilgit baltistan part of uh, jammu and kashmir the historical context is that it, this gilgit baltistan and the, the respective state in these areas were always independent states however um, after the ranjit singh's uh, rule was uh, uh, finished of uh, um, during the british raj and they have during the through the treaty of amritsar they have uh, sailed this state of jammu and kashmir so the those lands which were uh, northern areas which were once part of the rule of um, ranjit singh were also transferred to maharaja um, gulab singh um, in through this treaty from amritsar however we need to make this distinction 
and we make to we need to make sure that we make this distinction very clear to international audience that azad jammu and kashmir and gilgit baltistan are two different uh, cases it is important as he mentioned that you know it's, it's time it's about time that pakistan should give uh, all uh, political rights um, to the people of gilgit baltistan um, and it is important to incorporate them into the mainstream um and um i think uh, pakistan um there there are many options that pakistan could have uh, approach for example pakistan could have asked for the um partial plebiscite but that's probably not a possibility because the terms of plebiscite um, um were of such that both countries have to demilitarize whether pakistan is willing to demilitarize or not the whole region that is a question that is important pakistan could have asked for the um, could have gone for the uh, referendum under the constitution of pakistan that was one possibility but the, again if any referendum happens under the constitution of pakistan international forces especially india will not accept that that referendum however um, india itself has um created the similar unilateral action um but pakistan is not making this similar action pakistan is making a distinction between um uh, azad jammu and kashmir and gilgit baltistan and giving right to gilgit baltistan um perhaps uh, the historical um, context is different um yesterday we have uh, i read um i shared that with shayan also an article by any an author uh, stating that you know the situation of gilgit baltistan from pre partition is different and india cannot have a similar claim of gilgit baltistan the way it has on ajk uh, or the um, the rest of the valley um so um even by their own standards where the own authors are writing that in situation of gilgit baltistan is different um what is the right approach only the state has to understand whether they can go uh, for a referendum the request to for a referendum or a request for plebiscite to the un general assembly um i i think the right approach would have been to make a formal uh, request to the general assembly however uh, we understand without india's in uh, cooperation that would, have, would not have been possible and because plebiscite has to be done throughout the region um and demilitarized region and india's um, action of post 5th august of giving um domicile to non kashmiris have um, shows that india india has no intention to accept any sort of plebiscite um so i think um pakistan is in a fix uh, and pakistan has to think out of box and perhaps um that's the reason pakistan is going for uh, certain changes um i'm 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 i hope that all the stakeholders are considering international law um before making any decision with regard to gilgit baltistan thank you thank you uh, so uh, a follow up to uh, mr tamur malik uh, so do you think that with the proposed changes or the discussion on changing the status of gilgit baltistan do you think it would somehow dilute pakistan's uh, claim uh, on the kashmir dispute so first of all uh, general lodi had uh, raised some very valid points uh and uh, dr sadia has explained the the limitations that we face as a country uh and the distinction between kashmir and the gilgit baltistan situation very aptly uh, as well what i would like to say is that uh, uh, there is a concept of uh, developing state practice under international law uh and of course in this particular context there is no uh, right or wrong answer and it's a difficult decision for i guess all our stakeholders as well as to what needs to be done uh but to take the kashmir example in the post uh, 5th august scenario uh you know the legislative assembly structure that india has developed they have kept uh, parliamentary seats for the ajk region as well and 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 said that they will leave them vacant uh you know till such time that you know the, that can be part of their legislative assembly and they are doing it as a matter of uh, developing state practice and they are documenting it and these are things that we as a state need to formally protest and keep protesting to to ensure that that state practice does not become or is not deemed to be have been accepted by us at any point in time at the same time uh, you know gilgit baltistan is a, is a is a different issue is a distinct issue it is mixed with kashmir uh in in the academic circles or in the in the in the media debates but we should uh, you know all of us present here today i think everybody has a role it's not just the lawyers uh it's all the analysts as well and and the thinkers and the scholars 
that we need to highlight that the GB situation is different. And, and secondly, if we do uh, proceed with the with what appears to be uh, you know you know the position at the moment, uh, I feel that in in certain respects uh, it, it it is an inevitable situation for us uh, at the moment and would potentially document Pakistan's state position. So if you feel or if the general public perception at the moment regarding the uh, IIOJK situation is that India is making more and more difficult uh, for Pakistan or the, or the population of that territory uh, to, to, to come out of that situation. Uh, on our side, we don't have uh, those kind of challenges with Gilgit Baltistan. In fact, the people desire uh, that kind of national treatment. So we have a much stronger reason uh, for proceeding with the way that we are. Obviously, I agree uh, with, the, with Dr. Sadia that, that uh, it should be done carefully. All international law issues should be considered. Uh, but at the end of the day, it will need to be a strategic decision, which will need to be taken based on how India has been acting and what we need to do on the basis of the information and options available to us today. Thank you so much, sir. Um, we're delighted to have Dr. Salma Malik with us. Um, she'd like to ask uh, a question and give her comments. Uh, Ma'am, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm extremely grateful uh, to the IPRI administration and um, uh, the institution for holding uh, a dialogue on Kashmir uh, from this perspective because we have been talking about the politics, we have been talking about culture, so many other things, but lawfaring is something which is uh, uh, which has entered big time into uh, the discourse, international politics, but we are still not very literate on that and I think uh, more such powerful discussions uh, are absolutely required and three speakers have mashallah done uh, great justice to this uh, and we would appreciate if, if we get more such opportunities. Few things that I would like to ask, uh, one of course is uh, Taimur Sahib, you have also highlighted, Dr. Sadia Saiba, you have highlighted uh, about the Gilgit Baltistan issue, but uh, Taimur Sahib, you mentioned about the state practice, uh, but this constitutional inclusion of Gilgit Baltistan as well as AJK in the Indian constitution is not something which happened overnight. It was there for the longest time. And we never really bothered about that. In fact, we would have our students asking as to why there are seats in the uh, Indian constitution and legislation and not uh, enough by Pakistani government. And now suddenly, uh, and I, I'm not blaming anyone, but suddenly we have woken up to such glaring realities. Second aspect is, and I think this is a classic case of doing too little too late or realizing about the intensity of the problems a bit uh, late in the day. But the second issue is that when it came to uh, uh, the demographic changes, which the Modi government has uh, brought about now, brought about in the last one uh, plus year, uh, he had indicated about it in his uh, first uh, election manifesto when he was getting voted in for the first time. And I think either we didn't take it seriously or we thought that uh, India is going to stay um, true to any type of international obligations. And that brings me to my question, which is that when state actors, uh, you all, all three of you have highlighted the various fora in the international uh, jurisdiction, which deals with various things, Yet there is an extreme defiance by state actors from time to time. And of course, in India being a very, very exclusive case with regards to Kashmir. So how, how does the international uh, judicial system deal with such state defiance? And, and of course, as a state party, Pakistan has reacted to these things um, a little late uh, and very little in, as such. 
But uh, this is one aspect that makes the situation very difficult. So India does the pallet guns, India does illegal occupation. It ends up doing a lot of unilateral actions. And Sa Dr. Sadia has highlighted that there are certain issue areas where we have to go bilateral, yet they have unilaterally revoked so many uh, of the bilateral issues between the two countries. And there is nothing that we can do about it. So then what type of a legal course that we have before us. Um, last but not least, I would like to ask one aspect that, uh, and that is from Dr. Sh um, from Shayan Saab. Uh, when you talked about uh, uh, the Argentinian case and the extradition, um, I, I was kind of recalling, and I'm not an international law person, so I may stand corrected, that uh, when the war on terror was taking place and uh, there were drone-based uh, killings, uh, there were citizens from within Fata and uh, settled areas who had filed cases against uh, the American government or such activities that were taking place. So why hasn't any Pakistani or Kashmiri citizen within uh, the state, within these territories or outside filed a case against India for doing any of those uh, activities, genocidal or human rights violations? Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think if uh, Mr. Shayan, if you could, we could go in the reverse order. So Mr. Shayan, if you could answer uh, Dr. Salma Malik's uh, last question first. Uh, absolutely. So, so I think it's a, it's a very good point that you've mentioned. In fact, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, it was the Foundation of Fundamental Rights which sort of took the victims to file sort of an application before the International Criminal Court, if my memory serves me correctly. But to get to your question, uh, the issue is that this matter is a bit complex. So the victims themselves are not in a position to have any access to any evidence that they can bring forward. One, that's the issue. The other issue is, of course, traveling to those countries and then saying, okay, here is the application. This is what you need to do. So this is a very specialized area, which not even domestic entities within uh, Jammu and Kashmir are able to deal with. So that is perhaps why this is not the case. Now, Foundation for Fundamental Rights was specializing within that area. So they were in a position to help the victims. Now, this facilitative role is currently missing in the context of the victims uh, or the Kashmiri victims. So we need to build a linkage between those victims and organizations like, let's say, Trial International Redress. And that is currently missing. And because of this reason, we, we do not see claims of a similar sort being filed before these institutions. Thank you, Mr. Shayan. And Mr. Temur, if you could uh, give your views, please. Yeah, again, so uh, some very uh, pertinent uh, questions uh, raised by Dr. Salma Malik. Uh, I, I was just uh, trying to Google and, and see case against uh, Modi. Uh, or genocide or something and uh, you know my uh, my memory serves me right that uh, there were cases filed in the US and other jurisdictions against uh, the current Indian Prime Minister so uh, civilian um, action by uh, members of the Kashmiri diaspora as well as uh, others uh, uh, have taken place and they continue to take place so I think it's just that perhaps they don't get the same amount of publicity uh, in, in, in our media. Uh, uh, so, so that's one thing that perhaps needs to be corrected. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, uh, yes, uh, you know, the Indians have been doing uh, uh, things uh, like keeping seats for, for the Pakistani uh, part of, uh, of, of, of Kashmir uh, in, in their parliaments. But, so state practice to, for it to become customary international law doesn't happen over years. It, it, you know, it, 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 it's a different kind of uh, uh, time affair, time period that we are looking at. So while we may be late, uh, it does not, it should not stop us. It does not prevent us from documenting our opposition to all those actions um, in Pakistan. And I think uh, there has been some debate about Pakistan's political map uh, or, if, uh, or its effectiveness of, or, or, or utility. I feel that that's a very important, um, almost a lawfare act by, by the Pakistani state and should be viewed as such as documenting uh, our 
our legal and political position in relation to various aspects. So, uh, you, you know, the subset of the, of the, of the map perhaps shows, uh, uh, I was just looking at uh, Dr. Sadia's uh, first slide. It, you know, the, 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 there's a box showing the state of Junaga, right? So uh, again, not, this is not something which we debate often, or perhaps not even many Pakistanis would be aware of the, of the dispute regarding the Junagar state. But we, they, we have a legal position regarding that, which we should not be giving up. And we should be emphasizing on all these points uh, at various forums. And, uh, you know, and, and as the previous speakers have mentioned, I think it's not just a matter of, uh, of, of lawyers taking this up. As it is, we don't have many uh, in public international law experts in the country. So I would encourage more of you, any lawyers in this session, to, to study and take up uh, international law. Uh, we, need, we need an army of international lawyers uh, in this country, and not just because of the Kashmir issue, but many other uh, issues that face us. Uh, but, but it's more important uh, to General Lodi's earlier point that we create a body of our, uh, of our position uh, on the web and generally across the spectrum of uh, uh, academia, uh, talk shows, uh, journals, and so on, uh, where this is uh, this position is is formulated and presented and takes a dominant position when a third party researcher or organization wants to check the legal position of the Kashmir situation. And I think that, of course, we have not done enough on that as yet. Uh, but I'm hopeful that uh, with discussions such as these and all stakeholders hopefully coming uh, together on the same page on this issue, uh, we'll be more successful moving forward. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next, for the next question, I'll request Ambassador Asif Durrani to please take the floor. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the, uh, Tamur Malik, uh, Shayan Ahmad and Dr. Sadia Zahur for excellent presentations. Uh, and uh, definitely it's a, um, it's a fresh air to say the least because uh, on the international law, uh, I'm afraid uh, having served in the foreign service uh, for over 33 years, uh, this is our weakest link. Um, uh, I can say that uh, in, uh, in the last 33 years, the most weak department in the foreign offices are the legal uh, department. Reason being that there are very less candidates, uh, very less legal lawyers who opt for uh, the foreign office in its legal division. It may be partly monetary reasons or something, but uh, my observation, and this is also a question, uh, relating to this is that are we capable enough uh, of dealing uh, um, this Kashmir dispute uh, at the international forum? This is a part of a comment and uh, also a question. But at the same time, let me also say, let's quote some examples. When we talk about advisory opinion of the ICG, so I can quote on nuclear weapons, there's a very clear opinion given by uh, ICJ advisory opinion, and which is uh, a ritualistic in the UN General Assembly every year, uh, this resolution is adopted, um, uh, calling for banning of the nuclear weapons, but no one listens. And then uh, mind you, nuclear weapons are not illegal. Uh, while chemical and biological weapons are illegal, nuclear weapons are still legal. Of course, uh, there are five NPT powers, so they are legal. Uh, Pakistan and India, and in bracket Israel, uh, since they were not party to the NPT, so we have not reached any NPT laws and clause. So why, why I'm saying is, I'm trying to give you from the diplomatic perspective that how things work, and how then our legal system evolves into that. And when we were uh, probationers, we were taught that it's basically the municipal law which, is, which has got the value, not the international law. Please correct me on that because uh, we have seen that on that count because United States has recently 
blacklisted ICC personnel who were trying to prosecute uh, certain uh, UN uh, army people involved in Afghanistan or elsewhere. So this is the value of international law in front of uh, for the for the powerful states. So basically, it is the victor which writes the history. So we should not forget that as well. So in coming to that, but from the legal perspective, my question I would like to be enlightened is that uh, what about a provisional arrangement uh, uh, made uh, with the Azad Jammu and Kashmir, Gilgit uh, Baltistan? that they are given representation in our National Assembly. Provisional. Why I'm saying underlying is provisional because subject to final disposition of the Jammu and Kashmir state through a UN um, supervised plebiscite as uh, uh, mentioned uh, by Mr. Tamur Malik uh, that regarding under resolution 91, 1951, uh, India did that and India is still under the, uh, the decision of the, that uh, resolution also, the UN Security Council gave the decision and India accepted that, that by holding uh, elections in the occupied Jammu and Kashmir doesn't mean that the final disposition of the right to self-determination has taken place. So even legally, India is bound. That's beside the point that they have now actually declared themselves as occupying state. So that's why they have thrown out all their obligations, whether under the UN Security Council or under the bilateral agreement as quoted uh, by you on Shimla agreement. So, so it's a sheer, you can say, uh, the power politics which India has tried to play. Now we can, under the surface of the power politics, are we in a position legally as well as politically. Diplomatically, I can say it can be defended, but legally that we declare Azad Jammu and Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan as Kauzai provinces, hold elections there, give them representation in our National Assembly with a proviso that when the situation comes as was done by uh, Lord Mountbatten while accepting the instrument of accession that uh, this we accept, but this uh, matter would be referred to the people. So here we are, <coughs> in a way, paying the same uh, to uh, same, paying in the same coin uh, to the Indians. But at the same time, be prepared that we are at the moment economically uh, in a very weak position. And the, the, the wars are fought, uh, not, this is not the, the era of fighting uh, wars with swords. So we will not, uh, so the, therefore we, uh, we all understand what do we mean by that. So my, this question, if that can be answered, as well as my observation with regard to uh, uh, the state of uh, our legal fraternity dealing with international law. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, who would you like uh, to answer your question? Anyone. Any. Okay. So the floor is open for any speaker. So I, I, I'll, ask, uh, I'll answer the question about the capacity and then I'll hand over to Dr. Sadia to respond to the other thing. I, I, I think the, the capacity issue is real. Uh, you know, I think that many of us have been raising that issue over time. However, I would say that uh, the situation has changed. And uh, the presentation by, by the young Cheyenne today is uh, evidence of that, right? So th that is, uh, is what gives me hope. Uh, I've been discussing Kashmir now for 15, 16 years, uh, but it, it's, the, it's the new generation uh, which is coming well prepared in, into, into this and taking it up seriously, which is going to change the dynam dynamic for us moving forward. Uh, and and, you know, and, they're, and they, they are hopefully going to be many Cheyennes. Uh, you know, soon. Uh, the uh, other thing is that, you know, yes, I think what has happened at the foreign office is very unfortunate. Uh, the, the legal uh, and treaties division, it used to be a division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's not even a division now. So instead of actually upgrading the whole setup, we have downgraded it to an extent where it, it appears that, uh, you know, the stakeholders there don't want to take legal advice too seriously, or maybe there were concerns about capacity there. However, uh, as we build our capacity 
uh, more students and and youngsters come into the profession and take it up as a career path i think we'll have uh, suitable candidates which should take up these positions um, you know the international law advisor to uh, to the uk government is traditionally knighted within the first year of their appointment to that position that's how seriously uh, you know countries take such roles and positions uh, our case has not been the same as yet uh, but as this discussion shows uh, you know i think it is coming to the fore in relation to uh, you know the legal side and, and and disputes between countries without naming anyone i practice internationally and and represent you know clients all over uh, the region we have evidence of uh, we are we are seeing examples of uh, you know other muslim countries fighting with each other uh, in in many cases not a single bullet is being fired it's it's all lawfare at 20 different forums right so uh, and it's effective warfare if you ask uh, if you take their different positions and who are their soldiers in those uh, those lawfare situations are are international lawyers so i think we do need to uh, brace ourselves for for what's coming we need to be more uh, offensive rather than just reactive in in our strategy uh, and and with that i'll pass it on to dr sadia um thank you demo i uh, still I'm sorry uh, if i can just add to that to uh, the regarding my question that can we also have a government in exile of the jammu and kashmir uh, uh, of the indian occupied jammu and kashmir uh, can we make a government of a government in exile also if you can uh, you know club that question into one thank you or oh, i mean one is uh, regarding ajk government and uh, gilgit baltistan being represented in our national assembly as well as uh, and a government in exile of uh, indian occupied jammu and kashmir thank you i'm sorry for this mention um i want to start by what um so dr ambedkar they who just has entertained i want to tell you that you know i have worked with young students in last 5 6 years um through our um, mooting circuit and i can tell you there are um chayan is the product of that mooting circuit and is hard work obviously but there for sure there are other young uh, kids who are doing international law and taking international law seriously and having further studies in international law um in last 6 months uh, i have worked uh, with different um, stakeholders and people on international law and i take the opinion of young lawyers uh, practicing in international uh, field even more seriously because they come out of the box thinking and they have just they have they have the knowledge of the new developments um and so i am very hopeful uh, for the future of international law in pakistan um and uh, for sure even people like uh, bersh tehmur and myself uh, we still have to be um, um have to be heard by the stakeholders on different international law issues um, we have a traditional approach to these issues but lawfare um, is an important uh, issue and definitely as uh, bhesh jatin who has said that the um, wars are being fought by the international lawyers in the courtrooms and the states are winning or losing those wars um coming to the gilgit baltistan yes we can have the representation but we have to be very careful as with the flag we have made it categorically clear that this flag is a representation of pakistan's legal rights um as well as the um wishes of the people of jammu and kashmir so uh, we can make certain uh, amendments and give the representation to gilgit baltistan legally speaking however with uh, with due respect and mention of the un security council resolution and pending uh, settlement of the dispute in the light of un security council resolution anything that undermines the un security council resolution um will be um will dilute pakistan historical position pakistan's historical position has been strengthened by the un security council resolution and pakistan should not do anything which dilute it however we can work around it and we can uh, give representation to the people of jammu azad kashmir and uh, even for that matter can uh, allocate seats for the people of jammu um, because we do have this um, um, people who are from jammu and they are represented in the uh, state assembly of azad jammu and kashmir so we can give them uh, even the people of jammu representation into our national assembly however due mention as is already been mentioned in the, uh, the constitution of pakistan that 
that Pakistan um, respects the pending dispute in the light of UN Security Council resolution. So yes, uh, legally it is a possibility. However, um, it has to be carefully crafted not to undermine the UN Security Council resolution. With regard to government in exile, I think government in exile is a, perhaps one of those um, ideas which are symbolic uh, significance. However, we, um, we have to understand that um, those leaders who have any meaning, uh, perhaps the government in exile is more favorable when there is a um, um, kingdom and the king or the queen or the uh, royal princes are uh, in exile and they can represent the, their own state. In, in the case of Kashmir, because there are so many people, uh, so many political parties, there's no one political party, one freedom party which represents the people of uh, Kashmir. So if we can make them a government in exile um, somewhere in the world, that may be a symbolic thing, but will not have any legal um, um, significance or rather much legal uh, significance, I think this idea has been uh, debated and entertained in our, uh, by stakeholders and our by scholars. Um, however, I don't see any um, lawfare move or an addition to our lawfare narrative uh, by making a government in exile. However, um, perhaps Cheyenne has more to say on this um, particular issue. Thank you so much. Yeah, so just to add uh, some very quick points to what has already been said, uh, in terms of international laws weaknesses, so I'd just like to address that first. I think the disappointment that comes with international is probably largely has to do with the expectations that we've set for it. We must not forget that in, in domestic law or in municipal law, the effectiveness emanates uh, from the very fact that there is one power who can assert its will onto people. Now, we know that neither the United Nations nor the five powers can represent or mirror that model. So that is the first thing. We, we cannot expect international law to function in a way that municipal law functions. Having said that, uh, even in terms of when we look at politics, we need to convince people. And if, for example, let's say the US does not agree with our political stance, it does not care. So that's the same thing. But even in those cases, I feel there is a lot to be gained. So let's talk about, for example, the municipal law mechanisms. Now, universal jurisdiction is strictly speaking a mechanism under municipal law, but the power is sort of derivative from international law. So whenever we are able to classify, let's say, a crime against humanity in international law, we are then able to invoke that domestic mechanism. And even that domestic mechanism, for example, is then contingent on international law and the obligations stemming from it. Now, as for the ICC, we know that with the US, the tides have been sort of these very turbulent times in, in, in Trump's government. But even in the case of ICC, for example, uh, it has, so almost all parties, including major parties of the European Union have come up and stood up against the United Nations. Now, we've, we've seen over, over perhaps the past 10 years and even a bit more, we've seen this constant disregard for, uh, let's say, international law, which has taken place. The Security Council has been under deadlock. But now we're seeing a shift in the tide. And I think this has started to happen just this year. And why do I say this? I, I say this because when the United Nations announced those sanctions, there were actual blowback from other countries, which is specifically said, that okay, you cannot do this. And in fact, the prosecutor will continue to sort of uh, investigate those crimes and what will happen. Let's say uh, that particular US official, which is in under investigation is in, for example, a state party, let's say Switzerland, that particular state is then under an obligation to arrest that person and surrender that person to the ICC. Now, yes, it is ineffective in terms of whatever the US is doing and yes, uh, as sanctions have been invoked, but then states have stood up against it. Now coming to the JCPOA, for example. Now US through the Security Council mechanisms have tried to initiate snapback uh, mechanisms of sanctions against, the, against Iran at this time. Except Dominican Republic, none of the uh, 13 states in the Security Council supported United States. Now that happened, obviously United States uh, being sort of this discontent with all states in the Security Council, decided it will unilaterally invoke those sanctions, but of course other states do not agree with it. Then finally, like just I think in the last two weeks, Netherlands has decided to invoke 
uh, the jurisdiction or is trying to invoke the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice in the context of the Assad regime and the torture violations it has committed. So yes, I, I completely agree with you that it can never be as effective as municipal law, but we need to set our expectations and then we need to see this new shift in the tide and then we need to leverage whatever we can get because if you think about it, even when states disagree, politics does not do much at all either. Now, as for the question on government in exile, in theory, there is uh, nothing against this in international law, but it needs to be an authority representing the people. Now, that is a very factual question, which is not sort of settled by law. But if we see the question of Western Sahara, in fact, there was an authority or a government in exile, which was there for, for a particular period of time. And then obviously it transitioned into Western Sahara as well. But, uh, and, and perhaps uh, those familiar with the political aspects of the Kashmir dispute can answer this better. But uh, I think our uh, sort of government or authority representing the people for the whole of uh, Kashmir is the AJK government. And this is at least what the president of AJK says. I don't know if, if, if this is actually correct, but that's what he says. And finally, on the point of MOFA's capacity building, so someone I know at MOFA said this uh, particular thing that people come in with the expectation that they're going to do international law, but end up doing disputes which relate to employment law. So we need to bifurcate the ministry's legal division or whatever is sort of left of it. And yeah, over to the, over to the subsequent questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shayan. Uh, so the next question will be asked by Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, uh, Acting President Ipri. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Umar. Uh, a wonderful uh, discourse and uh, a very enlightening uh, discussion also. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is uh, pertaining to the definition of an occupying force. If you want to uh, ensure uh, indictment of Indian uh, illegally occupying forces as war criminals and occupying forces, we need to uh, establish very clearly in front of uh, international institutions, the legal position. Now the legal position is that uh, Indian forces entered AJNK, uh, sorry, IJOK, I, uh, under uh, their own uh, interpretation of uh, international law, because the instrument of accession was uh, signed by Maharaja Hari Singh while he was at uh, Jammu. And uh, till that day, India has not budged even a single inch from its stance. And we have not been able to disprove that stance despite uh, several uh, uh, you know, writers writing like Alistair Lamb of the spurious nature of that instrument of accession or the forced accession, but so far, uh, Legally, we have not been able to clear this mist. So I would like this uh, question to be asked, uh, maybe Tamur Malik Sahib uh, or uh, Sadia can answer this. And what are the three steps we can take to uh, declare Indians as uh, an occupying force, considering the very fact that the instrument of accession aided Indian presence in Kashmir is a reality upon which is premised their basic stance. Uh, secondly, uh, there are questions of uh, international humanitarian law, law of war, related to that. But when we talk of uh, human rights violations, most to my mind, in the Gulliver you know, parlance, those are just like pin pricks that one day might slay the uh, giant. And it's a good strategy, by the way, and we must pursue with all in all earnestness. And I would like Shayan to answer that. Similarly, like how we declare, uh, how we get Indians uh, occupying forces declared as war criminals and occupying forces. How would uh, in the short term, we could, uh, you know, uh, advise the practitioners in the next fortnight or a month to take few steps that should clearly, uh, you know, create some kind of international impact. And uh, maybe 
by giving our uh, government level help to Kashmiris to record and document those systematic you know violations of human rights that constitute crime against humanity could be done so i would like a quick recap from uh, both sets of uh, speakers um so mr temur if you could answer the first question regarding uh, the uh, occupying force right uh, again uh, excellent questions from from the acting president of ipri uh, and very relevant as well I, I think uh, as we discussed during the presentations that occupation is a is a factual matter is a matter of fact uh, it, it's not uh, that the occupying forces need to uh, to de declare occupation of of a, of a territory in order for it to be considered as an occupation uh, there is a, a primarily three limb test uh, which uh, we briefly discussed as well uh, and uh, you know most legal practitioners not just pakistanis uh, but others as well would potentially agree that that test is uh, is fulfilled in the case of uh, iiojk uh, uh, what me and there is no forum as such unless of course with all the limitation that we and dr sadia specifically mentioned about where we can go and contest uh, uh, this matter with india you know there are limited legal forums where we can just go and say okay you are occupiers of this territory so this this is a battle to be pay, to be played out in uh, mainly in the public domain in in the legal scholarly domain in the, in the academia and all that and i think perhaps we we need to be more visible and more active in that respect uh and and uh, and make stronger cases just in relation to uh the occupation part so so that it's clear and then it becomes unambiguous uh a, a, you know there there are uh, statements from uh, international organizations such as the ones we've mentioned during the presentation which uh, already uh, sort of uh, refer to that occupying nature so so all of that can be utilized uh, in our favor um in relation to the international forums where we could contest you know cases with india um unfortunately you know if if we want to say it like that i think maybe india is uh, has been scared of an international legal dispute uh, because its reservations uh you know and statements with respect to all international treaties basically uh, have one core objective and aim which is to prevent pakistan from taking it her to uh, an international legal forum for dispute resolution so uh, that seems to be the corner store of their stone of their treaty negotiations uh um, in all respects whether it's a investment treaty or a trade treaty or a, or a territorial matter related treaty so so with with that i'll uh, i'll ask dr sadia to add perhaps uh, some more points to it um before uh, dr sadia answers the question i would just like to uh, ask uh, uh, brigadier rashid wali janjua to kind of um just amplify the question a little he wants to add to the question so before we move on to dr sadia and mr shahan ahmed uh, sir if you could just uh, add to the question we thank sumar uh, uh, for tamur malik sir in fact uh, we need to take cognizance of a, a fact that uh, we are all a victims of a original sin unless we uh, rectify that original sin uh, every other solution would uh, wither on the vines of uh, expedient solutions and place books you see indians very comfortably are ensconced in a fort the fort they have created around themselves is of a legal you know uh, battlement that is based upon their stance that we came here because instrument of accession was signed as per the independence act of 1947 either dominion had to you know uh, seek uh, options from uh, princely states either to join india or pakistan uh, kashmir exercised that option and we are there so from there follows all those problem including the question of gilgit baltistan azad jammu and kashmir 
Now we gave, uh, uh, for our part, a greater degree of autonomy, I think, than Indians to uh, AJNK and uh, Gilgit Baltistan. Of late, they have their uh, legislature, they have their chief minister in Gilgit Baltistan. Same is the case in AJK. Now, if we are also trying to, uh, you know, uh, react to India and do the same things that they have done by revocation of 370, annexation of Kashmir, though it is premised upon, as I said, they are in a uh, battlement and they think that their, uh, uh, you know, stance is valid, would we not be opening ourselves to needless international criticism? Because there's a lot of uh, confusion regarding uh, the lease of Gilgit also, some people say it was a Gilgit agency, some people say it was a Gilgit Wazarat. The Gilgit Wazarat, in fact, we also concede because that constituted those areas that are uh, Gilgit, Astor, Bunji, they are part of uh, present GB. Certain areas, Nagar, Chilas, Hunza, they are not part, they are part of agency on which the Kashmir uh, state had suzerainty. Even if we concede that those states those areas are outside uh, the definition of territory of Jammu and Kashmir, still a sizable chunk remains. So uh, my question is that uh, by giving GB a status of a province, are we not uh, treading into a minefield that later on we might uh, you know, face problems once we go to the international organizations to plead our case and there we fa face problems on international fora like United Nations. So uh, these questions I uh, leave for Tamur Malik Sahib and even uh, Sadia can chip in. Thanks. So I, I, I will just uh, respond to it briefly and then hand over to Dr. Sadia. Um, you know, again, as, as mentioned previously, it, it has to be a strategic decision that one has to take. It's often said that uh, solutions of today can become problems of tomorrow. And I think in terms of our strategy, the hope would be the decision we take does not become uh, a problem tomorrow. Whereas uh, the decisions that Indians have taken on 5th August and afterwards uh, do become problems. Uh, it, it will only, time will tell how things play out. But what is happening for sure, as we are discussing the issues and the, you know, the way uh, the Indians are trying to integrate the, uh, you know, the entire territory uh, with the Indian um, dominion uh, in, or, or the country now. Uh, in our case, the situation I would say is slightly better. If they can take the risk of doing that with IIOJK, uh, we are uh, less at a risk in comparison uh, with re in relation to Gilgit Baltistan. And, uh, but just uh, as a disclaimer, I would say, of course, all le international legal uh, options need to be considered carefully. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a, a, a strategic decision where we know what the potential risks are, but we should have a strategy of how to counter and minimize any legal, strategic, political risks associated with such decisions. Um, I hope uh, you know that answers your question a bit. Uh, and over to Dr. Sadi. Thank you. Uh, I want to say that um, there is absolutely right that we have to see the situation as a whole. Uh, first, we have to um, be sure about our narrative about the effective control of the Maharaja uh, at the time of partition. Because Christopher Sennel in his book um, has written that you know at the time of a partition, most of the people, in, most of the people of uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir were up in arms against Maharaja's government because of the uh, threat of fear of genocide. So we have to understand or we have to make a narrative about the effective control, whether the Maharaja was indeed uh, a lawful um, sovereign of the state at the, uh, at the time of independence, whether he has the capacity to sign the instrument of accession first. Secondly, um, um, our problem perhaps is that we have signed a standstill agreement and then you have to see whether in the presence of standstill agreement, Maharaja could, uh, was uh, allowed in the legal, um, under the legal regime to sign an instrument of accession because the British uh, legal advisor and the American legal advisor at that time have made a statement that it was uh, illegal to sign an instrument of accession in the presence of a standstill agreement between India, uh, Pakistan and the Maharaja. So we have to be sure about the, our narrative on the instrument of accession. Even 
if we take india's uh, account uh, that you know it was signed indeed signed uh, early on before the indian forces um, entered into the territory of jammu and kashmir uh, we have to ex- india have accepted the this evidence come from india that it was an, a conditional acceptance based on the as we have already discussed previously uh, the speakers have discussed that you know um, the state was um, india has accepted my mount um, baden has accepted the uh, insurance accession conditionally uh, and the condition was that you know the uh, it request will go back to the people of uh, kashmir and um, after the plebiscite or uh, right of self determination um, it will be decided whether people of kashmir want to stay with india um, or pakistan thirdly it is also important to highlight the contrast or the comparison with junagarh um india can't have it both ways um in, the, in that particular case they do not recognize the instrument of accession and in this particular case they do uh, because in this particular case the majority of the population is muslim and in that particular case in junagarh's case it was the most um a uh, population was a hindu majority and uh, maharaja went to india for asylum and the ruler of the junagarh came to pakistan so we have to build this narrative that you know india first about the effective control the second about the instrument of accession whether it was signed whether it was possible for because as elisa lam has mentioned that you know it was, perhaps it was not possible for him to sign the instrument of accession at that time because he was traveling third it was that how can india have different standards for junagarh and for over hyderabad dakkan and then uh, about kashmir and fourthly when it, uh, we have to also make sure that we understand and um, make a distinction and make it very a part of our national narrative that gilgit baltistan is separate entity from jammu and kashmir historically and pakistan have separate uh, sort of accession uh, with the with small, uh, with uh, this and uh, princely states uh which are part of the gilgit baltistan for example hunza and nagar so and uh, we do have the royal families uh, of these um, of this princely state and they can uh, help us make a narrative uh what was the situation during before 1947 or b- before uh, ranjit singh's reign came to end so we have to make a holistic um, narrative and distinct um, make a distinction between gilgit baltistan and ajk and perhaps if you are trying i'm not aware of all the details of the new province or the de- uh, development of the new province however if you are trying to make gilgit baltistan a separate entity or a separate province of pakistan the idea is to make a distinction between the um issue of aj uh, jammu and kashmir and gilgit baltistan so pakistan has is has a um has a strong ground but um i hope that we will make a clear distinction um from our act from indian act that pakistan is open to right of self determination uh, exercised by the people of gilgit baltistan as well under the auspices of the un security council or un general assembly so pakistan has to make this distinction india has taken similar steps but has uh, made it very clear through its action that uh, india is not willing uh, to entertain the question of plebiscite pakistan on the other hand even if it, may, it makes uh, takes step to make gilgit baltistan as a province should be very categorical and clear in stating that pakistan is open to un um, led plebiscite or referendum or any sort of uh, exercise of self determination by the people of gilgit baltistan and ajk so that's the distinction that pakistan has to make and as as i mentioned earlier pakistan has made that very clear even when they issued the new flag that uh, it's a presentation and our claim in accordance with the light of the un security council resolution so we need not to undermine un security council resolution and even without making um, undermining the un security council resolution we can take a constitutional uh, move and as um, them who has rightly pointed out if india can do it why we are scared we have to take steps because of stagnation um or this this policy of not doing anything and you know reacting to what india is doing is um, it, it is not fruitful we need to take steps and perhaps um make a, a narrative before taking these steps uh, we have a national consensus before taking these steps um for sure and pakistan should remain open as shayan has mentioned earlier uh, for the fact finding un fact finding missions um for open inquiry for plebiscite for self determination um demilitarization even uh, if india accepts uh, on the similar grounds um so pakistan is open pakistan has nothing to hide um the situation in gilgit baltistan and ajk is not even 
um, close to what is happening. It's like far, far uh, different from what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir. And international bodies and UN reports have mentioned that we might have smaller issues, uh, particularly which have been our legal issues throughout the country, but no uh, serious violation of human rights um, or humanitarian law in, in, uh, in AJK or Liga Bastan by our forces. So the situation is totally different and Pakistan has to make this dis distinction and the national narrative have to build around this and uh, all the development, constitutional development should be, um, should make a good reference to the UN Security Council resolution and Pakistan, uh, I, I think it's, 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 um, it's, um, it's wrong to make any assertion that Pakistan actions are similar to those of um, India in with regard, even if we go for making uh, Jammu uh, Gilgit Baltistan as a province, um, but we still have to wait for the details, uh, how this will be done, how this will be reflected in the constitution, whether this government has the, uh, this constitutional power to make this happen. Um, even if we do this, still it's very f far different from what uh, India has done. Um, thank you. Uh, Sadia, I, if I may, if I may elaborate a bit, uh, my point was, you see, uh, our whole Kashmir stance is rooted in UN resolutions. And we always say that uh, we base our principal stance of dispute resolution based upon those resolutions. Now, India has a problem. India needs, India is shying away from plebiscite and India wants to change the demographics. So India wants to annex and they have gone and they've done an illegal act and we have uh, you know, criticized them on all fora and we're still doing it as a national narrative. Now, should we do exactly the same? What is our compulsion? We don't have to change the demographics. We are comfortably ensconced. Our uh, Gilgit, Baltistan, most of them, they are willingly uh, joined us. So we have no compulsions to annex or to change the status. And we have already given them a kind of a quasi, uh, you know, representative status as well. So my question to you as a, from a lawyer's perspective, international lawyer's perspective, what would you say if tomorrow Pakistan goes to uh, United Nations and UN turns back and says that, look, you say that, uh, you know, plebiscite should be held Indians have claimed that they have uh, integrated their part of uh, occupied Kashmir. Now you've done the same and uh, your stance is rejected. So purely from an international lawyer's perspective, what's your uh, take on that? If I'm allowed to help uh, Madam Sadia, just uh, not being a lawyer, but uh, because sure, you, sir, are sure. pressing this, uh, you are pressing this question again and again, so I would like to uh, put in a bit. Um, uh, dear Brigadier Janjua, the, it is not uh, true that there's no problem in Gilgit Baltistan. The people of Gilgit Baltistan are quite upset uh, that for the last 70 years they have been kept in this state uh, in which they have been kept. And we should also remember that by trying to be a good boy at the international level, we should not lose something at the inter inter internal level, which, which is quite possible. So I think uh, we, uh, yes, the, the, the procedure adopted, I also said that it should be such that it should be, if not totally acceptable to the international community, should be partially acceptable. Uh, for example, going for a uh, referendum or something, if, if a plebiscite is not possible. Uh, but the situation in Gilgit Baltistan is such, we have to act, we have to act fast, we cannot keep them out of the mainstream. So, as I said earlier, please don't uh, lose in the internal front just by trying to remain a good boy in the external front. Thank you. Um, sir, I just want to add um, that as an international lawyer, I think I, um, I still want to make a distinction between the, uh, what India has done and what Pakistan is trying to do. Um, again, Pakistan is very clear. Pakistan, I hope when Pakistan will make any amendment to the constitution, the reference to the UN Security Council the due reference to the UN Security Council ref, uh, resolution will be there. 
uh, Pakistan will remain open. Uh, Pakistan still is open. Pakistan has given access to UN bodies uh, in the past. Pakistan is willing to give access. Pakistan is open to fact-finding missions. Pakistan is willing for plebiscite. Um, India has to come to the table. Pak India has to accept the uh, request for plebiscite. Um, yes, if I have to advise the government of Pakistan, I would suggest uh, to write a letter to the UN uh, bodies uh, for a plebiscite, which will be rejected by India, and then you, henceforth, Pakistan can move, make a province. However, um, and in those circumstances, not, a, not as a Pakistani, but as an international law student, I understand that Pakistan actions are totally different from what India has done. That is unilateral action, which is a violation of not only UN Security Council resolution, but bilateral Shimla agreement. Um, so Pakistan is and um, so Pakistan is not doing anything. Pakistan should be make sure that we give due notice to the UN bodies for plebiscite and in, in failure do so, giving uh, as a uh, um, the other speaker has mentioned that we have to give uh, rights to the people of uh, Gilgit Baltistan due rights, full rights, full political, economic rights um, to participate in the national politics, in national forums. Um, and, um, and when we are giving reference to the UN Security Council resolution, that means that we are not changing, we are not attempting to change um, the demography of Gilgit Baltistan and we are open to uh, plebiscite. Also, we have to make distinction that the problem is of the Azad Jammu and Kashmir and the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir and not of Gilgit Baltistan. Um, and we have to make the distinction and perhaps the step is towards that to separate two entities and to make it clear that the, both issues are not similar issues and we have to make that distinction. Uh, and Indian Pakistani acts are not similar to that of India's and it will not dilute our um, position if we give due respect and you. Um, 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 mention of the UN Security Council resolution in any constitutional amendment that we wish to make. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sadia. Uh, what I'll do is I'll try to ask some more questions just so that we can cover as many questions as we can. Uh, the next question is from Air Commodore uh, Mozam uh, Dar. Uh, he, he has asked a question from Mr. Temur Malik and he uh, asks, uh, despite violations of various international laws by the Indian government in uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, how can one explain the apparent lackluster response coming from the United Nations? Over to you, sir. So uh, I, I think this is a question that, that people ask, uh, that why is the international community mute uh, on, on these things? Uh, but as I briefly highlighted in my uh, earlier discussion, uh, you, you know, various entities from Genocide Watch to Amnesty International to Human Rights Watch have raised their concerns of the human rights violations, crimes against humanity, uh, you, you, you know, potential uh, examples of early genocide uh, and all that in, the, in their recent reports, especially after the 5th of August. The actions of uh, the Indian government uh, in the last year, uh, you know, have not gone through as they potentially expected them to. Uh, on the on the UN side, the the question is more about the the, the UN uh, did the UNSC did take up the issue uh, in a special meeting soon after the action of fifth August. Uh, but the question about whether a resolution or something is going to be passed uh, and what effect it will have that of course depends on our diplomatic and political power at the moment uh, to be able to do so. So uh, we as a in many ways, the custodians of the legal rights of the Kashmiri people, we have to, as Pakistan, have to uh, be more active at the international front, at the international diplomatic front, to ensure that uh, such actions are taken. OIC and others have uh, passed resolutions on this, uh, and therefore there's no reason why a stronger resolution from the UNSC should not come forth uh, in the future. Uh, thank you, Mr. Temur. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Riyazul Khalik, and he's asked a question from Mr. Shayan Ahmed. Uh, Mr. Shayan, he asks uh, that if you could please comment on Kashmir's armed conflict uh, character, and where does it fall under international law? Uh, so I think uh, Mr. Temur has already discussed this particular part of uh, an occupation in this context. So 
basically to sort of reiterate what he has already said it uh, the the situation in kashmir should be classified as one an armed conflict which is governed primarily by the rules of international humanitarian law and then it must be seen as an occupation because india is there without any sovereign title without the consent of the people and therefore it must be viewed as an occupation now occupation has certain elements in terms of apart from the ones that i have mentioned is effective control now does india have effective control over that region the answer is yes the mere imposition of a lockdown and even the actions before where it was able to legislate legislate its will on parts of that territory that in and of itself shows the existence of an occupation under the laws of armed conflict and therefore the primary regime which applies is international humanitarian law perfect um uh, i'll move on to the next question so the next question is from mr adil mukhtar he is an assistant research officer at ipri um the question is for mr tamur malik um so sir uh, considering the unilateral actions that india has taken in occupied jammu and kashmir uh what do you think and it leaves a very dangerous kind of precedent so do you think it could have any kind of implications on other disputes between pakistan and india for instance uh, the indus waters treaty what are your views on that so uh, you know each, each issue is separate pakistan has various uh, international legal disputes with india uh you know sir creek uh, be, being being one that's been ongoing that's a different thing and again uh, the important thing there as well as in the indus water treaty related issue the kishan ganga uh, dam uh, dispute and all that has been how the states play out their international legal practice so so from pakistan's point of view let's say in the iwt related issues we should not uh, let india's construction of dams uh, on on the river uh, flowing to pakistan uh, go unnoticed or without protest and without legal protest of course the, the there are various uh, that's another debate there are other legal challenges uh, surrounding that uh, issue uh, but each each of these is 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 a separate legal matter with its own merits and uh, circumstances but one common theme would be that if uh, india is taking unilateral acts in 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 relation to any of these whether it's trying to uh, you, you know come into the uh, the territorial water zone uh, which we contest because of sir creek or building dams in in relation to indus water treaty or the action in relation to kashmir is to keep developing our international legal state practice and to protest at all possible international forums the illegal actions uh, of our neighboring country thank you mr atamur malik uh, we we'll, we'll move on to uh, the last question of uh, the session and uh, the question again is for uh, mr atamur malik uh, the question is from mr khalid chandio he is a research fellow at islamabad policy research institute uh and he asks uh, that why lawfare option was not adopted right from the beginning uh of the kashmir dispute um uh since pakistan was part of the western bloc led by the us pakistan could have been in a more um they could have leveraged uh, its position in that bloc to kind of you know uh, settle the kashmir dispute uh what are your views on that sir i think it's uh, it's easy to uh, look at history and criticize uh, i i think we should have a forward looking approach uh, in this respect uh, what's happened has happened uh, luckily for us as i mentioned earlier state practice uh, you know cannot be looked at merely in in you know in a matter of years but it evolves over time uh, it may be late but it, it's uh, it's not too late and we can still use our, our position uh, to our uh, to our advantage and to document uh, you know the practice as we wish it to be uh, i i think in the in the past there could be all sorts of reasons including the reasons related to capacity which have been mentioned by some of the uh, the participants as well uh, but we we hope that moving forward that will change uh, you know and debates like these are important uh this uh, i feel is no longer primarily uh, a political issue uh in fact most of our 
interactions with India now are no longer political issues, but are in fact very complex international legal issues which need to be discussed and dealt with accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Temur Malik. With this, I'd just like to thank all the speakers for being extremely patient, for being extremely comprehensive with their um, uh, talks, their presentations, and their point of views, and being very candid. Um, uh, with, uh, with this, I'd like to now request Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, Acting President Depri, to present word of thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Omar. Uh, I once again thank all the uh, participants and uh, especially the three learned speakers and uh, who have uh, given very uh, good insights and we stand educated after this exhaustive session and I'm sure all these uh, observations and very valuable suggestions which have been proffered would be captured by us and uh, we'll do our humble best to synthesize them into a policy paper for the relevant uh, policy practitioners. And uh, with this, I once again thank uh, all the three uh, participants for their uh, pains and uh, all the trouble they took to enlighten us. And we look forward to uh, future interaction with them as well. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. thank you, sir. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of today's webinar. I thank everyone for their active participation. Um, I would also like to request everyone to please follow us on our official social media pages to stay updated uh, with our research activities. Thank you to the uh, esteemed speakers once again, uh, and we look forward to welcoming you uh, in our next webinar. Thank you. Take care. Allah Hafiz. Thank you. Hello.